The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Friday, uh, June 15th. I don't know where the year has gone. I feel like we were just saying it's January and now we're June 15th. Woo! Where did it all go? For a lot of you, if your kids haven't already started summer break, they're starting it this week. I know, it looms large, doesn't it? <laughs> We'll be talking about that uh, this week and in the coming weeks. But uh, we are going to be with you live for the next three hours. We were not here yesterday. My fault, because uh, I had friends in from out of town. And I, as I tell you guys, you got to celebrate when you can, right? And it was my son's first day of summer break. So we took the day. It was lovely. And I encourage you whenever you can to also take the day. Uh, but we're here now. We're going to be with you for the next three hours talking about topics having to do with autism and being more effective, more efficient, working with our kids on the autism spectrum. Because uh, I know as a parent that's high on my list of to do things, be the most efficient, effective member of that team, or at least be an efficient, effective member of that team. And so mostly we talk about ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, and there's a good reason why we talk about it as much as we do because it's the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. Woohoo! It is effective for our kids and not just some of them, it's effective for all of them. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing whether your child is only affected in a small amount and just needs a small amount of ABA, some skills to fill in to help them to navigate the, the social world. ABA is very effective for that. If you have a child who's much more effective, who needs help with everything, that their skill deficit is overwhelming, ABA is going to help you to create an environment in which you're going to get progress. All of our kids are going to end up someplace different, but to know that there is progress available for all of them if we have some basic tools and apply them very creatively to our individual children. This is not a cookie cutter. It's not a one-size-fits-all, so you do have to have the tools and then figure out how to apply them. It's a creative art is what I have come to. But we as parents and as teachers and practitioners can apply these tools in lots of different ways and we can share with each other and say, well, this is what I did in this circumstance, which may not be right for everybody, but then you go, oh, but that element of that sounds like something that would work with my child and you take it and tailor it to your child uh, and their specific needs and that's a wonderful thing so this really is meant to be a conversation between you and I and everybody else who's watching and listening I know that you have so much to offer you're a wealth of knowledge you may not feel like it today <laughs> you may feel like oh you know it's Friday morning and I don't know what's going on with my hair and uh, that's how I'm feeling today uh, I don't want to put that on you but uh, you are a wealth of knowledge and always no matter where you are on this journey, whether it's your first day or it's your 300,000th day on this autism journey, you know something that the rest of us can benefit from, even if it's that you have a question, because uh, sometimes we don't know what question to ask, right, until you tell us. So be a part of the conversation is what I'm getting around to. There are lots of different ways for you to participate. If you're watching us on autism-live.com, one of the ways that you can participate is if it says live on the top of the the screen you have a question box there just type it in hit enter and it shows up right here in front of me in real time if it says rebroadcast then there are a lot of different ways uh, to participate as well as if you're watching it on any other site the email that you see right before you 
this is a great way to participate. You can send us an email where whatever time it is where you are, it doesn't matter what time it is here, the email is going to get to us. We'll answer your question on the next live show and we'll send you a typewritten response. How much better could that be, right? And and I got to remind you guys, usually the typewritten response is not from me, <laughs> which is wonderful. We refer you out to experts and it's amazing who you can connect with when you take the time to connect with us. It's really kind of fascinating. Uh, you can also phone us and leave a message for us if it's not a time when we're here. If we are here, somebody will answer your call. If we're live, they'll ask if you want to be patched in directly to the show. And you and I can be having a conversation and you can be having a conversation with whoever is sitting next to me because uh, we have guests on the show from time to time. It's a really fun thing to do to interact with them. And you can also Skype in with us. We've been having more and more people Skype in. That's a really fun thing to do. Don't feel like you have to be invited. If you want to Skype in, give us a call. We'll, we'll hook you up here. If you have a camera uh, and you want for us to be able to see you, we can make that happen. And if you don't have a camera on your computer, I know on my laptop at home, I don't have a camera on it. And um, But I, you know, I could Skype in from home audio only and so can you. So feel free to take advantage of that. You can also talk to us via Facebook. This is a great way. I know so many of you like to answer the question of the day on Facebook and we love that. And then you guys interact with each other. But there are other ways that you can interact and you can just type in and say, hey, I wish you guys were covering more of this or more of that. I will tell you honestly that our Facebook page could use some likes. We're pretty pathetic in the like department. Um, so if you have time, go to the Facebook page, like us and write a comment. Say, you know, I, Shannon, you don't talk enough about toileting or you talk too much about toileting or you talk too much about your kid, enough about your kid, right? I'm a proud mom, so I do. But if it's too much, you let me know and we'll curtail that. We're here to serve you quite honestly that's what this entire show is about so Facebook us let us know you can also tweet us as well and I know some of you are very good at the tweet I'm I'm insanely jealous I'm chartreuse with envy as we say in my house and I'm trying to get better at it but you can tweet us so feel free to visit Twitter and tweet away to us that's a really fun thing to do and I mentioned that there are lots of different ways that you can be watching the show uh, not just on autism hyphen live.com but you are, we're also available on blip tv which is a wonderful way to watch us you can pause rewind fast forward skip things go back uh pause when your child is having an issue that you need to you know you put your child to bed and everything's wonderful and you start to watch and your child gets up uh pause right uh, you can do that on blip which is a wonderful thing you can also do that on youtube we have a whole channel on youtube that's available to you that you can go back and watch past episodes i think sometimes it's really just so beneficial like we we're just talking about toileting you know you can tune in and see dr. Amy Kenzer talk about toileting and you can tune in and see art Wilkie talk about toileting and sometimes you know it takes hearing things in a different way from different people to really get it and understand it and feel confident and so lots of different experts on the YouTube channel and we're also on iTunes these are all free downloads by the way um, you can subscribe to us on iTunes we love when you give us iTunes reviews we just absolutely love that so uh, wonderful wonderful thing to do again free and we're also on Ustream, so that's another fun way to watch us on Ustream. If there's a way that we don't offer that you say, oh, you know, I like to watch things on this and so, and you guys aren't on there, please tell us, because it's obviously something we don't know about and you can educate us. We love to be educated. I mentioned that I am a mom. And I always like to remind you guys that even though we're going to talk about ABA a lot, I am not an expert. I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm making it sound like I have this all figured out and I'm an expert because that nothing could be further from the truth. I am a mom. Um, I'm not a BCBA. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not uh, a licensed advocate, but I'm a mom. My son was diagnosed when he was two and a half and he just turned nine. I can't even believe that. Uh, and so I've been on this journey for a while and along the way I've picked up some information and had the opportunity to talk to some people but I am still in the learning phase I am on the learning curve um, but I want you to know that what my job here is is to be the go-between so experts come in and uh, I have an opportunity to share them with you for them to talk to you but I have the opportunity to call people and ask them your question I have access on your behalf so think of me as your new BFF uh, 
have it whenever you need to know something about autism. Uh, and the nice thing is it's free, you guys. So you can't beat that, right? That instead of having to call somebody up and pay a whole lot of money out the gate and not know which questions to ask, right? You can call me up and say, here's what I need to know. And I can do some of the legwork for you, hook you up with the expert that's got the answers for that. Um, it's, it's a good thing, I think. And some of you are taking advantage of it, and I love that. Nothing is more, I, you know, talk about ABA terms, nothing is more reinforcing for me than when I can get you guys an answer. And sometimes it takes me a couple of days. I gotta search down your answers for you, but you guys have been really patient with that, and I want to be helpful and useful to you because people were for me. That's the long and the short of it. My son is doing so well, and, you know, he still has a little ways to go. Let's not, you know, gild that lily too far, but he's doing so well. And it's really because I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. If I had had to figure this all out myself, I don't know where we would be, quite honestly. And I know a couple of you uh, called and wrote in this week and said that sometimes when you're watching the show, you get a little pang of guilt because you feel like you haven't done enough. I just want you to know that we all feel that way, right? But it isn't true. It feels that way. And we have to own our feelings, but it isn't true. You're doing a lot and you can only work on what, some things, you know, not everything at a time. And you can't act on things you don't know. So if two years ago when your child was diagnosed with autism, you didn't know about ABA and you didn't, or you did know about it, but you didn't know how effective it was. And you heard some things about it that weren't true. You're finding out, forgive yourself. We all have that. We all have something that we, you know, didn't look at enough or didn't get enough of or whatever and we carry some false guilt but that's really what it is and you know what that does is it prevents us from taking advantage of what we can right now so I hope you'll join us I hope you'll learn what you need to learn ask the questions you, you need ask for the help that you need I've been telling you guys you know I know that there are stumbling blocks to ABA I know it but would you do me a favor and let us share it with you tell us what the stumbling blocks are say I you know we just can't afford this. And then let us help you to figure it out because guess what? Nobody could. I couldn't have afforded it. There's just no way I could have afforded it. But other parents said to me, here's how you get your funding. And I leaned into them and thank goodness I did because my child got the help that he needed. Well, that's he needed. That's what I want to do here for you. Lean into me. Tell me what's stopping you, whether it's that you're afraid or that you don't have the money or you're afraid you don't have the money. <laughs> you know, you're afraid of what it's going to do to your family. You're afraid it's going to what it's going to do to your job. You're afraid of what it's going to do to your child, right? Um, because it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Tell us what's preventing you. Let us help you to find the answers because a lot of time there are answers. Okay, so that's why I want you to write in and, and let me know what's what's preventing you from getting the help that you need and and let me share that burden with you uh, we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day uh, this is where we take on one word one phrase one anagram at a time and try to figure out what in the hey nani nani these people are talking about right um, it's such a jargon intensive journey and I don't know about you but it just sucks the energy right out of me uh, I ask somebody a question and they start answering answering and I go, oh no, I have no idea what you're talking about. But over time, we have to make friends with the jargon just a little bit at a time, just like we teach our children. We're not going to teach them a huge, big skill all in one moment and expect them to be successful, right? We can't expect that of ourselves. Usually on this journey, we're overwrought, overwhelmed, overtired, over everything, right? Um, so, it, which makes it even harder to understand these things. So we're trying to demystify it. One word, one phrase, one anagram at a time. We give you the actual definition, which is sometimes just ripe for making fun of because it's so full of extra jargon. And then we give you the, the working definition, something that hopefully is more user-friendly. Sometimes even it isn't accessible. And you know what? Don't worry about it because you'll, it'll start to make sense over time. 
It will. I promise. Okay, today's phrase is operant conditioning. This is something you're going to hear about from time to time. Uh, and ooh, let's take a look at what the actual definition is. You ready? The process by which an operant response, see already I go, oh, you're using a word that I don't know in the definition, right? Uh, the process by which an operant response is brought under stimulus control by virtue of presenting reinforcement or punishment contingent upon the occurrence of the operant response. I just can't, you know, if you, because operant conditioning, conditioning is the word that I know in this sentence, right? <laughs> but operant is the word I don't know, and let's count how many times it is in the definition. Thank you so much, right? <laughs> but, uh, Let's take a look at what the working definition is. Okay, using reinforcement to increase desired behaviors. Now this is, I know if there's a BCBA watching, you're cringing because this is a very watered down explanation, but it's the thing that we need to know as parents and teachers, um, that when we do operant conditioning, what we're doing is setting up a circumstance where we're going to give some sort of reward or reinforcement for the behavior that we want to see. That's really what it is. Uh, and it's uh, a wonderful thing. It's very useful for all of us, not just for our kids, but for all of us. If we, you know, principle number one of ABA that we talk about all the time here is that in order for any behavior to be maintained, any behavior that we do again and again and again, it has to be rewarding in some way. Um, now, you know, you might reject that out of hand and say, I just don't think so. That can't possibly be true. But stop and think about the kinds of things that you do on a daily basis. I'm not talking about your child right now. I'm talking about what you do on a daily basis. You know, you probably brush your teeth on a daily basis. Well, why is that? And at some point, you know, you, you didn't come out of the womb brushing your teeth on a daily basis, but at some point you began brushing your teeth on a daily basis. Why? What's the reward? And, you know, I know that immediately we go, well, you know, I want my teeth to, I want my breath to smell good. I want my teeth to feel good. I want uh, to not have the big dentist bill. I don't want the drill when I go to the dentist's office. All of these different reasons. Um, and some of them are long-term reasons and some of them are short-term payoffs. Usually, not in all cases, but usually it is the short-term payoff that really is the thing that keeps the behavior going. And that's something to remember not only for ourselves, but for our kids. Um, because it's true for us that in all the behaviors that we do, we do because they are in some way reinforcing to us. And if you think about that, then think about the flip. What's the behavior you wish you were doing more of? And why aren't you? Chances are that you haven't found the way to make it really reinforcing for you. Ah, right? That's a little, little bit tougher when you think of it that way. But if we can solve that puzzle, we can create long-term behavior patterns uh, and, and doing things that are really good for us. <clears throat> We can also stop doing things that are bad for us by figuring out what's the payoff and removing the payoff. <sighs> Exciting, right? Well, that's true for us. It's also true for our kids. So if we have a child who isn't engaging in functional communication, whether that's vocal speech or using sign or pointing or gesturing, right? We can increase that behavior by making it more reinforcing for them. We can. I guarantee you that we can increase that but we just have to figure out how to make it reinforcing. And part of how we do that is doing it in little bite-sized morsels so that they don't get overwhelmed. Um, and likewise, if the child is engaging in something over and over and over again that we don't want them to do, whether it's hand flapping or walking on their toes or beating their head against a floor, we have to figure out what's reinforcing about that, find something else that gives the payoff instead of the behavior we don't want, and take away the reinforcement that is currently making them do this behavior over and over and over again. It's clever and it works and it works with all of our kids. So, uh, ABA is operant conditioning. We're finding ways to reinforce a behavior uh, because we want the behavior to happen and we're finding ways to take reinforcement away of behaviors that we don't want to see as much of. So there, that's operant conditioning, using that reinforcement to make it happen. Uh, and of course, in true operant condition, there is an element of it too that uh, is also, um, it isn't just adding reinforcement, it's taking reinforcement 
reinforcement away. We have seen time and time again through studies that that is not as effective with our kids. The whole idea of punishment, not as effective. It just really doesn't get the job done. So, I mean, there are extreme circumstances in which we will. I certainly from time to time have implemented uh, response cost systems with my son where, you know, if he does something, he loses something. That's punishment, right? Um, but it really isn't as effective on a regular basis as rewarding things. So that's what we want to focus on, reinforcing rewarding behavior that we want to see and taking the reward away from behaviors that we don't want to see and, and finding something else that rewards that that gives that reward that's appropriate okay we always have uh, a question of the day for you as well and I love this question of the day because this is something that I struggle with constantly and especially lately you know we had a birthday party for my son and we we've had a lot of people in our house and we even had um, a really good friend of mine visiting uh, this the last couple of days and her son who I hadn't seen in the longest time he's 19 about to be 20 and he was asking me a lot of questions about autism and whenever I'm around somebody and that you know doesn't have a child on the spectrum the question always comes up so what exactly is it and I don't you know I hear a lot about it but what exactly is autism and so my question to you guys today is how do you explain autism to people when they ask you about it what do you say because um, I you know it's so important to have they call it an elevator pitch now when somebody asks you something that you're passionate about that you'd be able to talk about it in the course of time it would take you to take elevator to another floor like 20 seconds to a minute and I I have to be honest that I struggle to explain in a really short and concise way what autism is and I I find myself constantly trying to tweak it and I just don't have it under control yet I want to find that absolute thing that I can say well autism is this and that I feel really comfortable for the longest time Right after my son was diagnosed, I referred to him as being autistic, and there was something about that that just hurt my heart. It just didn't didn't ring right. It felt bad. It just felt so, ugh, you know, the end of a conversation. I know that there are many people out there who are adults who prefer to be referred to as aut autistic, um, and I completely bow to that. But as a parent referring to my child, I just have to say that it just was like a dagger, and um, and I thought it was just a matter of acceptance that I just needed to get to it, but it hurt every time that I said it and then I saw Holly Robinson Pete I think it was on Oprah and and she said you know I just don't really like it when people refer to my child as autistic I refer refer to, I prefer to say he has autism because you know there are a lot of like when somebody has cystic fibrosis we say they have cystic fibrosis we don't say they're cystic cystic fibrosic um, and she said and there's so much more to him than autism so I prefer to say that he has autism it's just one of the things that he has which actually led to my son and I writing a book about him having autism and we referred to him as having autism for quite a while there was still something about it that wasn't working for me and I'm a big believer in that whole thing about if you're going after Moby Dick you have to pack the tartar sauce right you have to like be prepared at the start of the journey for where it is you're going and forge ahead you may not get there but it you go with fortitude and so I I finally said to my husband one day I you know what I want to say? I want to say that our son is recovering from autism because that's the truth. He has autism and he's working through it and he's in a process of healing the different parts of him that are not that are, that are holding him back from doing the things that he wants to do. So, and that fit, uh, I really, and we still use that term that he's recovering from autism. He's in the process of recovering from autism. And I think that pays homage to what he's been doing. Um, and I keep thinking, oh, okay, that was a process that I went through to get to what was right for us. And at some point I'm going to get to the, where, what's right in explaining autism, but I sure don't have it down yet. And, uh, so I'm curious, I would love to learn from you guys. So how do you explain it? What do you say? What are the words that you say right now? I mean, yesterday I said, well, you know, it's a neurological difference um, in the way the brain develops. And sometimes I say, you know, uh, it's sort of like it, when you're building a network, 
And sometimes, you know, you start out probably you would build local long distance and then build long distance. And for some of our kids, it's like they get long distance without the local service. And we need to go in and help them to reconnect so that they have the local service. I just don't feel like that's it yet, but that's how I currently explain it, but I'd love to hear from you guys how you explain it. So write in to us. You can email, you can Facebook, you can tweet, you can call, you can Skype. Uh, you can even snail mail us all those different ways, but I'd love to hear from you because I sure need some help in that area. By the way, we also always have a topic of the day. In our entire week this week, we've been talking about challenging behavior um, because it's a part of our our world, right? Whether our child, quite frankly, whether our child is on the autism spectrum or not, we're always going to see some challenging behavior, right? Um, but it's especially poignant when it's autism, and I think it's especially hard for us as parents because there are times when, and, and I, I still struggle with this, I'll be honest with you, and I, I know that a lot of you do that you'll write in and say, well, you know, this is happening. Is this because it's my child or is this because this is developmentally appropriate or is this because it's autism and does it make a difference in how I work on it? And I think those are good questions to ask, but the important thing to remember is uh, we can ask them and try to figure it out, but it doesn't matter. We can change it we can change it. Even if it's a behavior that's happening because it's part of the autism diagnosis, we can change it. We can affect change on behavior. Um, in small increments, sometimes, and it, sometimes it takes a little while, but we can change behavior. And we know this, it's been scientifically proven. And if it isn't something, if it's, you know, something that is happening because it's age appropriate, well, we can still tinker with it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because there's always growth and development. And if it's something that the child is engaging in that isn't on the autism spectrum, which a lot of times the challenging behaviors that we're most fearful about, like elopement, like uh, self-injurious behavior, like violent behavior, those are not part of the autism spectrum diagnosis. They will sometimes come hand in hand with not having functional communication skills, of course. Um, but we can change that too. We can change that behavior. We can give the functional communication skills and give the child a way to get their needs met so they don't have to kick. They don't have to hit their head against the floor. They don't have to bite someone. Um, they don't have to keep getting up out of bed. They don't have to wet themselves. Uh, we have answers to these behaviors for individual children when we apply the tools of ABA. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, and to that end today, there's several different things that we're gonna talk about. I know I'm like so excited about it because it's Friday and Friday is a wonderful thing. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about feeding issues today because that's one of those challenging behaviors that our kids won't eat certain things and will eat other things and they won't eat at certain times and they won't eat certain colors. And uh, it's, uh, it can be to the point of, you know, talk about a spectrum, it can be just frustrating, which is bad enough, right? Or to the point where it's absolutely fear inducing because there are many of you out there I know that are worried that your child is not gonna get the nutrition that they need to be able to sustain learning or life. So it's a serious issue. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the different things uh, that go along with feeding issues. We're gonna talk about self-esteem because self-esteem is a really important issue for our kids. We were talk talking with Evelyn Gould on Wednesday about bullying and how it's unfortunately, statistically, a part of too many of our children children's lives. And of course, we want to change behavior of the kids who are bullying our kids, but we want to do what we can to help our children. And one of the things on that list is to build their self-esteem. And there are ways that we can do that using the principles of ABA. So we're going to talk about that. And then at 11 o'clock, oh, you know, do you hear the angels sing? We get to have Dr. Jonathan Tarvox. He is the head of research and development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And he's such a wealth of knowledge. He's going to be in talking with us today and it's a great opportunity for you to ask questions. What I love is that he's a behaviorist but he talks about research that we you know that we read and see that he he kind of demystifies when when you're looking at that study that the media says oh well new study shows da, 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 and he takes it apart for us but also different behaviors that we talk about and he'll say well you know here's the research on that and here's what we found to be effective 
Oh, gotta love that. So he'll be in at 11 o'clock and you can even right now be writing in your questions. If you're not gonna be able to be with us at 11 o'clock, you can write in your question now and catch it later on Blip or on YouTube or on iTunes. It's a wonderful thing. So I hope you'll stick with us. I hope you'll participate in the these myriads of conversations. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about an academic tip that we can be working on over the summer to help especially our younger kids um, to excel in school and to excel in life. So stick with us. Mostly the behavior started at night, but it was invading the day where he would just speak one syllable and babble and pace around. When she was a year old, she lost speech. Um, she did never seem to request me for anything, even for food. He told me over the phone that I should just put her in an institution. I was devast I was, what was the institution? A hospital. Yeah, isn't that nice? He told me that it was possible or likely that Ruffin would never be employed, that he would never work uh, productively that he would not know that I loved him, nor would he love me, nor would he be likely to marry. There's a 50% chance that he won't be able to talk at all, but if he does talk, he will only be able to, you know, make simple um, desire requests, I want, things like that. And probably by the time he was 10, he'd be in a home. Doreen told me that he would recover, and Doreen told me that he would go to regular kindergarten. I really have a very normal kid now and lots of normal worries, but not extraordinary ones. My name is Deli Popola, and I'm one of the creators of TheOtspot.com. TheOtspot.com is an online support system for families and specialists who are affected by autism across the whole world, share inspirational stories, find resources in their area. Um, hope you can join. Welcome back. We have a couple of different shout outs that we want to do and I'll remind you again later on in the show. But uh, earlier this week we had Sean Colton on, a dad, a dad blogger who is writing a children's book called Legends of the Boo Monster. And I'm so excited he's on Kickstarter because he just needs some funds to finish the book. There are lots of opportunities. If you go to kickstarter.com, go to Sean Colton, S-H-A-W-S. And Colton, C O L T O N, and you can donate as little as a dollar. And I have to say, you know, there's just something wonderful in karma. If you have a dollar to give, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and you guys have been showing up in force, and I love that. If you have more to give, I was thrilled to be able to, you know, take care of two things at once that I supported this family and made my son's day. Because if you have $25 to give, uh, you not only have given an opportunity for this book to be completed, but he will base a character in the book after after you or your child and give them one line of dialogue which uh, my, and, and it's these fantasy characters because that's really what it is is that he took his son who has an autism diagnosis and uh, he and a friend made this fantasy character the boo monster which is for his son and the boo monster goes through this event it's really this beautiful idea you guys about autism and I think we're all going to love the finished book and to have your child have a piece in it I don't know there's just something really magical about that for me and I know when I explained to my son you know that there's going to be a character in the book that's going to be based on him and that he gets a line of dialogue in the book he was so excited so somewhere down
down the line I'm gonna be able to put that into his hands and for $25 to do that which was so exciting to him um, and to be able to help this dad I just and to help countless people because they're gonna be able to put this book in their child's hands and hear about autism in a way that I think is really important I'm getting all the climate here um, but anyway so that's at kickstarter.com Sean S H A W N C O L T O N or you can search for Legend of the Boo Monster uh, really amazing and you, also when you get to his Kickstarter page you'll see uh, links to his blog so really wonderful thing to support that dad also want to mention that a couple of weeks ago we had the gen the two gentlemen who are making the documentary Not Forgotten the untold story of autism in Ukraine and they are an, a, a contest. Uh, if you go to uh, www.notforgottenthemovie.com, you'll see right there there's a place for you to click uh, to vote for them in this contest that they're participating in. You will have to log into Facebook in order to vote, but you can vote once a day up until June 30th. So they've got 15 days left, right? And if they come in first, first through sixth in the contest, they don't have to be first, but if they come in first through six, they're going to be able to finish the film and shed light on this area of the world where autism, oh, you guys, it's just so, I, it, it's like the dark ages. You know, we, I know we're striving to get more things where we are, but it really is like the dark ages there where they're still, up until 10 years ago, it was illegal to give a child a diagnosis. <sighs> of autism. So you, this is an area that needs our help and attention. It doesn't cost you anything to vote for them. Um, and if they come in first place, not only will they be able to finish the film, but they'll also be able to take some teaching materials, translate it into the languages that are necessary in the Ukraine to be able to help families and even doctors, you guys, to be able to help them. So it's a way that you can participate every day. And I do think when we do something for somebody else, Oh, you know, some days, and I remember the early days when I would be really in a dark space, but if I could do something for somebody else, even for a minute, that didn't detract from what I was doing for my child, it lifted me up out of whatever malaise I was in, right? Uh, so a really good thing to do. Also want to remind you, because it's summer, and we're about to talk about an academic tip, this is a long stretch of time that we can use to its fullest, right? We want to be effective, efficient, and we don't want to let this time pass. And typically, I, you you know, I hope it's not your case, but typically we have fewer services as parents available to us for our children during the summer months. And our children stand to lose the ground that they've gained. What if we could turn that around? What if we could turn it around and make it so that they gain ground instead of lose it? You know, it would be lovely even if we just maintain, right? But if we could gain ground, woohoo, right? Well, I'm using skills at home, so I'm a big fan of it. It's the same curriculum set of lessons that my son had the benefit of that helped us to get where we are. And I'm continuing to do it at home because our intensive ABA program is over, but I'm still doing uh, things with my son using the skills program. So I speak firsthand that I do love it. And, uh, you know, there are parts of it that are time intensive, but it's an investment in your child. Taking the assessment for your child and answering the questions, and believe me, I got frustrated doing it, but it is that investment in your child and you only have to do it once. Um, in any case, uh, there is a monthly fee when you participate in skills because it's online, it's curriculum online. Um, but if you pay for one month this summer, they're going to give you the other two months for free. How luscious and lovely is that? Because you might be sitting there thinking, I just don't even know what to teach and I don't know how to teach to my child. I, I'm a former teacher, you guys, and I think. I really had that day when I looked at my child and thought, oh no, I think he might be unteachable. Um, it's not the case, good news, um, but I go to skills and I don't have to invent the wheel. I have the lessons there, they're appropriate for my child because I took the assessment and we work on something and I have teaching points where somebody saves me the time. Uh, so I don't have to do it and go, oh, well, what I should have thought of was this. No, somebody saves me the time and it's all very easy to follow. Um, so you get one by one month and you get the other two months for free. That's really an amazing deal. Uh, it's less than $80 then for the summer. I mean, amazing. 
so skills, you can go to www.skillsglobal.com because we really want to see the entire world have skills, don't we? Skillsglobal.com. Also, I have to mention, I know it's just like a stream of things to talk about today, uh, that we had Nancy Alspa Jackson on the show on Wednesday. She's the executive director of Autism Care and Treatment Today. And she mentioned that they're a big fundraiser starting today at 6 p.m. Central Time. So do the math for where you are. Um, but the speed gamers are raising money for act today today now this is amazing because it's a group of young people who play video games and they do it online I can't wait to see this because it all still doesn't make total sense to me but you can log on you can go to I think it's speed gamers oh it's the speedgamers.com the speedgamers.com and starting at 6 p.m. Central Time today uh, and going till June 22nd you can log on and and they, I guess they do it around the clock and take shifts with, and they play, this year they're playing Pokemon. Uh, so your child can watch, you can watch, you can put in challenges and say, you know, if somebody will put the controller on their head for five minutes and play with it on their head for five minutes, I'll donate five dollars, whatever, you know. Uh, but in any case, they have already raised a thousand dollars. They haven't even started yet. And remember that this money goes to ACT Today. This is the money that funds all those grants to families for the things that they need. It's really amazing. You can go to the ACT Today site and link to it there and check out what ACT Today does because it's amazing what they do. And times are tough, right? Uh, donations are down because of the economy. We all get that, right? So in all of these cases, whether it's Sean Colton or the Not Forgotten or Speed Gamers, it, you may sit there and say, I have no money to give, Shannon, and I totally understand that. Um, but you probably are on Facebook or you probably blog yourself, share it. Share it and spread the wealth in that way. And remember that for the not forgotten, there's no cost to it. Um, but share the information and just put it up on your Facebook or tweet it and say, hey, speed gamers are raising money for autism. Anybody who's interested in gaming might want to check it out and you'll you'll have created something. Uh, and you still get the good karma from that. Okay. All right, I mentioned we were gonna talk about an academic skill today. We got this period of time, the gaping summer, where we want to accomplish things with our children, right? Well, um, and again, if you do, if you're doing skills, you're gonna put in your child's birth date and you're going to answer questions about their current ability. We always wanna be working on things that are age appropriate. We don't wanna teach something to a five-year-old that a, a typical, a totally typically developing seven-year-old couldn't do, right? That's frustrating. It's not efficient, it's not effective. So we always wanna be age appropriate and we wanna be skill level appropriate. Um, and skills helps you to figure that out. But one of the lessons that's in skills is about community helpers. Because when our children get to school age, that is essential that they know about it. If you stop and think about the, the amount of uh, confidence that you have to have in a group of people to take your precious little bundle and leave it at the gate, especially when autism is on board and you don't know for sure that your child is going to be able to communicate to you if something has gone wrong or that they're going to handle a, uh, a situation in the right way that's an emergency. Oh my gosh, that takes so much strength, so much fortitude to leave them at the gate. Um, but one of the things that we can do to help our children, and they teach this in preschool and they teach it in kindergarten, but for our kids it's going to take extra work. We have to teach them who community helpers are and what those community helpers do and who you go to for help. And we can start this with very young children, even on the spectrum. And what I love is in the skills uh, lesson, it breaks it all down and it gives you different suggestions. But one of the things that we did with my son uh, when he was doing his intensive ABA was that I was given the assignment, frequently this happened, I had assignments, and you guys will too, where I, and I usually took my son to do my homework with me so that we had a couple of different ways that we experienced this. But uh, one of my assignments was to go around and take pictures of of real live people in our community who were community helpers. So we went to the fire station and we took pictures of the firemen and of course we called ahead of time and you can do this too with your local fire department and ask and say, you know, I have a child on the spectrum and I'll tell you what, 
I have done this and I and because somebody recommended it to me and uh, I have not heard back from a single parent who has done this that they've gotten anything other than uh, firemen who are like please come down and visit us uh, you know and they will tell you that if they're in the middle of an emergency that they will have to reschedule right and we all know and accept that but they love it when you come because they want to help that's they've devoted their lives to it and they understand that sometimes for kids with autism that all their gear and everything can be so overwhelming and there was one fireman who told me a story about having to break into a home that was on fire and trying to help a child with autism leave the building and how heart-wrenching it was because the child was so afraid of him and that all he was trying to do was help and that he was really worried that he was going to lose his life and 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 to him more importantly that the child was going to lose their life if he couldn't get them out and it was a little bit of a struggle and he said no please bring your children down and have them get to know us um and so we went more than once but we went down to the fire station and they they let them touch everything and smell the smoke on their jackets and it's, the whole place smells like bacon right and um and put the jacket on and we took pictures of my son in the jacket with the hat on they let them get up in the truck and you know do the steering wheel very reinforcing for my child not necessarily reinforcing for every child but you can take it slow and see how much and they meet the firemen they see the pole if there's a pole or the dalmatian if there's a dalmatian and see where the firemen cook and live they become real people to them um, and and our fire department has these little stickers where they're honorary firemen for the day and all that just from a phone call right and we did bring cookies I think it's good to bring something to thank them because they don't charge for that and and, um, but we took pictures of everything. So he was there, he experienced it, and we took pictures of it. And, uh, you know, Fireman Bob, we have the pictures of Fireman Bob. So it was no longer just, let's face it, you can download a picture on the internet of a fireman, right? And you could work on community helpers in that way. You really could. But how much more powerful is it for the child that they met Fireman Bob and we have a picture of a fireman? And so when we're working on, you know, what does a fireman do and who do you ask for for help in certain circumstances and what do you do if a fireman comes to rescue, you know, it just, it's, it, it, they're, the lesson gets done quicker if it's more specific, right? Same thing with the policeman. We went to the police station and we, you know, met the, the guy at the desk and he called the duty officer of the day out who met my son and and they talked about, you know, the, the jail. And let me just tell you that that little lesson has stuck in my son's head. He's like, oh, don't want to go to jail, um, you know, and, and had the little mini tour of the police station and saw the police car and all of those things went um, and took pictures again, went and met the paramedics and saw what an ambulance looks like and all of those different things so that my son felt like he knew these people. He knew the uniforms. Now we took the pictures and then from there did DTT with the pictures, right? So we kind of did it backwards in some ways that we went and did the natural environment first, brought it back to the table with the DTT where we would put the pictures out and say, you know, who's the fireman? And we worked on it in lots of different ways about what does a fireman do and if you need help you know who do you go to all of these things um and we you know a doctor and a nurse and we did a veterinarian and we did all these things and i will admit that in all of them i didn't go and do the exper experiential thing um but i waited until a time when we were gonna go and do something like that a blood draw or something that i was getting blood taken or he was and say this is the nurse this is the doctor um but especially the ones where it's an emergency i really took the time to take him to the individual places and now we go to things like you know fourth of july we go and the fire truck's always there and my son walks by and hi and sometimes he runs into fireman Bob and sometimes it's other people but he knows that those people are there to help him and I know that when he's at school if something were to happen and a fireman came in he would not be afraid he would not run the other way from a policeman um, that he knows that those are the people that he goes to for help there are other parts of the lesson that we individualized for us that you need to individualize it for you um one of the because we live close to los angeles and um you know so it was important to me to talk about how do you know a real policeman from an actor policeman <laughs> yes we have 
actor policeman sometimes in Los Angeles, and uh, so that he would know if he was asking a policeman. And he, this circumstance came up. Uh, I was there, uh, but I said to him, if you're ever someplace and you're asking for help and you don't know if it's a real policeman, you ask them to see and hold their badge. And if their badge is heavy, then they're a real policeman because the the costume policeman, they have a badge and it's light. Uh, and he loves that. He meets a policeman and says, can I um, hold your badge for a second? And they, boy, they get it out and talk to him about it. They're really good with our kids. So really important lesson, community helpers, it's something you can do over the summer. It's like mini field trips, you guys. And it sets them up for success. And it sets you up for success when you take your child to school and know that they're there and that if something should go wrong, um, that they will respond appropriately with the, the appropriate people. It's a lovely, lovely thing. Uh, by the way, these community, help, community helper uh, lessons and how to do the DTT parts of it all available in skills. So with the teaching points and all of that, really, really lovely. But get out your, I always say on your list of things when your child gets diagnosed, if you don't know what to ask when people say, what can we do for you? You need to, you need a digital camera. You need a digital camera where you can take pictures and there are all kinds of services online where you can, uh, you know, plug your camera in or, t or take it in and, um, into a store and pop your little disc in and print a picture immediately. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times that I was, you know, at nine o'clock at the store printing things out for lessons the next day or worse there in the morning. Uh, always great to find the 24 hour store that has the, the photo place open. Uh, and, but it's, in the realm of things, it's a lot less expensive than flashcards and it's so much more personal. So there you go. Uh, that's our academic tip for the day. Stick with us. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to take on feeding issues. But coming up, uh, and we're going to be a little late on it today, but we are going to show you this week's episode of The A Word. So stick with us. Here I stand. A man, someone who has overcome struggles, someone who has endured perceptions of what others thought of him, thinking he was stupid because he was autistic, or simply believing him to be nothing because he was different to them in their minds. But I stood my ground. I just wanted to say to the organization in general, alongside helping me to improve communicatively and socially, the other greatest gifts you gave me were the value of discipline and a good work ethic. To quote Anthony Kiedis, to celebrate you is greater now that I can. You helped me to realize that the harder you work, the likelier you are to achieve success. Having had to work very, very hard to recover from autism, this discipline has continued to serve me well. I also realized that you taught me a lot about and instilled within me a quality of having compassion and sympathy for other people. That you will be concerned more with the needs and wishes of others than with your own is something that I am awe and I constantly strive to be. And in closing, the only way I can sum up card for all of you is love. Everything you do to help families in need, you do out of the sheer love of wanting to make a positive difference in people's lives. And as I stand here before you as a mature adult, I have to say that I'm extremely grateful for your unwavering loving commitments to helping others and me recover from potential life roadblocks and become active and contributing members of society. While I can't overcome obstacles without a will, I cannot have a will without the love of those supporting me. And without love, I am nothing. Thanks again so very much for your love. Everything that you've done and continue to do, please give my best wishes to your families, everybody else with Cardi was in here, and especially all of your clients and their kids. I'm confident that they too will be able to overcome, and I know that they'll be successful with what they do as long as they continue to put their minds, hearts, passions, and best efforts into it. That's it. Welcome back to Autism Live. That was, of course, uh, my good friend Nick Yates that you were just seeing, and we love Nick. Nick is one of my favorite people. Uh, he's just an awesome, awesome person, and he's going to be joining, uh, be, be in the building this summer, and so from t I hope from time to time he'll drop in and we'll get a chance to talk to him. Uh, but in any case, I promised you a feeding tip. 
We've been talking about challenging behavior and sometimes the food thing, I gotta say, there is an element to it because there, you, it's emotional. We wanna nurture, we wanna feed our children, we want them to enjoy it, we want, we feel that responsibility. There's an emotional tug there. Um, so it, and it's power packed for all of us. Our food, you know, I always say you go to something and the people's responses, we, I went to, uh, it wasn't really a funeral, it was a memorial service. And uh, it, it was a very interesting, we went to the beach and had this lovely thing where everybody talked and, and shared about this wonderful person who had passed. And then we all went back to a house and we were waiting. They were going to, you know, we, everybody was promised this spread. And I, you know, there's something that grief and food and, um, but it was just so interesting to watch how people reacted because the person who the caterer was late and they got lost and, oh my gosh, it was about an hour and a half that all these people that were grief stricken were waiting for food and it was just very interesting to watch the behavior and how emotional people got because the food was not there uh, and how everybody put the you know all of the emphasis on the food when really the truth was that everybody was feeling the grief and the loss right but there is something about food watch the holidays right and people are like no we have to have this food no we can't have that food why can't this person eat this how can you never eat that oh it's a emotional, right? And as parents, uh, feeding our children, and I think, you know, I know some men that are this way, but especially the moms were like, oh, I want to feed my child. Food is love sometimes, right? Um, and for our kids, they have I think all kids have issues, but especially for our kids, they have extra issues sometimes. And how do we combat that, right? Um, and I've said before that my child, he's very good about eating his veggies. He's just, he is a very healthy eater, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have issues, right? Because um, sometimes our kids have ex issues with categories of foods that it's like, well, I don't like this texture and I don't like this temperature and I don't like this color. Um, and of course they don't say that. <laughs> as if they said, well, you know, I don't, I don't care for the texture of a banana. Uh, if only, right? If only we could get to the point with functional communication skills where we could get to that. But instead, they spit it out, they scream, they cry, they act as if it is life and death, um, that it's just horrifying to them. It's traumatizing to them. Um, and I think a lot of times we become fearful about the battle for food. And I think um, the good news about that, if there is good news about that, is that it really shouldn't be a battle, right? We don't want a battle at the table. We don't want a battle of the food. So the first thing that we always hear from the experts is don't battle. Don't, 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 don't. Um, but we can affect change. We don't just accept and go, well, my child only eats French fries and chicken nuggets um, because that is not appropriate. And I think we all know that, but there are days when it seems like a good idea, right? <laughs> when you just don't have the energy or the strength to battle it. And, you know, and that's okay occasionally, but we can't just accept, okay, there's only two things that my child will eat. So when we have the issue specifically with textures or colors or temperatures, what we want to do is, you know, our, our word the other day was systematic desensitization, right? So we, we want to do that with food. We want to systematically desensitize them to whatever the big ugh is with the texture or the color or the temperature. And we can do that ever so slowly, ever so slowly, because we don't want to get to the point where we overwhelm them. We've had several different food experts come in and talk about the fact that if your child has an issue with texture, let's say that your child only want, they we're fine with baby food and they're not eating anything that has any kind of a grain to it or any kind of a crunch to it and you need to make that change. Uh, hopefully you already have the food processor, but if you don't, you're going to need to get a food processor. And what you're going to do is for a short period of time, you're going to keep giving them the texture that they like. Uh, and I guess it goes both ways because there are some kids who don't want to eat, like my son does not like creamy and we've worked over a long period of time uh, to the point where, you know, he, he likes things that are crunchy and then we made things, you know, a little less crunchy and eventually to things that are smoother. Um, and 
preferential, especially when it's textures, making sure that the taste of it is something that they already prefer. Because my son, you know, creamy, uh, smooth, didn't want to do, but he loved uh, the texture, he loved the taste of things like uh, mutabool, which is eggplant that's uh, smooth, and hummus. My, my son loves bitter tastes. Um, so that tahini, the sesame seed paste that's in the, the baba ganoush or the mutabool, and the hummus. And if you don't know these things, if you've never had hummus or mutabul or baba ganoush, oh, I, I, and you like the taste of bitter things, I, I thoroughly encourage you to try those things. They're wonderful. And my son loves those. And so that's kind of how we got him more towards a smooth category. Um, but uh, most of the time, I think it's the other way around, that kids prefer the smooth and, and don't want to go to the grainy kind of texture. So you do it very slowly. You give them very smooth. And then you just push the food processor one second less. Uh, so it's just got a little bit of chunk to it and then a little bit of grain to it. And you work your way up over a period of weeks just slowly and if you get to the point where the child refuses you go back to the last place like a prompt you go back to the last place that it worked and reinforce that and go oh you're doing such a good job eating that you're such a big girl you're such a big boy and you know if you eat this then we're going to go and do this afterwards and oh, i'm so proud of you and and really reinforcing that with whatever reinforces them that's what's really important and slowly grain your way to the point in the food processor where they're eating things that have texture to them um, same thing with colors that you know if you see that the child just absolutely only wants to eat white things right you can slowly go to something that's yellow or slowly go to something that's light green I think it's important to encourage them to play with their food so if your child for instance likes mashed potatoes and maybe you can't eat potatoes but you're doing mashed collard flour instead um, which especially if you put some mashed white beans in with the cauliflower you're gonna get something that's really healthy and if they like mashed potatoes and can't have it then mashed cauliflower with mashed white beans in it it kind of has the same flavor and texture as potatoes I don't know how that works but it does um, but you know, one of the things that we've done over the years is that we talk about eating the rainbow and how fun it is to put different colors in and, and like, you know how sometimes you play with paint and you take some yellow paint and you take some blue paint and you put it together and it makes green. Well, if you've got mashed potatoes and you take some spinach and grind it up and add it to it, it turns it bright green. Then they're more interested in eating it as a result of, and if you put just a little bit of fresh spinach in it, they, they're, they're not going to balk at the spinach. We've also learned from the experts that if you take just a little bit of something, put it with something that they do like, and over time increase the amount of the non-preferred food, their taste buds acclimatize to it. And of course, the thing that I've heard over and over again that I just am amazed at is that it literally takes, the, on average, 20 times of pre presenting a food before a child will actually eat it. 20 times. I think I gave up well before that. Um, so don't give up, but move slowly slowly remove yourself from the battle put it on the plate you know so you've got the chicken nuggets and you got the french fries there and you put the mashed cauliflower there too and you don't have to talk about it you don't have, you know you really don't you can say there it is and if they don't eat it the first couple of times it's not the end of the world maybe the third time that you put it there you go okay uh you know if you, you only put two nuggets instead of three on the plate and they eat the two nuggets and they ask for more or vocalize or whatever and you say yep you can have one more or even if they haven't vocalized you know they want another you hold up the nugget and say one bite of that and then you get the other nugget it's all a negotiation right you're reinforcing taking the bite with the nugget good girl you ate the the thing whatever it is so you get the nugget or you get more french fries um, but do it in small amounts don't sit there and expect them to eat a huge pile of mashed cauliflower the first time oh our expectations get us in trouble all the time don't they
All right, so there is our feeding tip for the day. It's time, we're late, uh, but it's time to go to the A word. This is the wonderful documentary that's being made at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a precious little boy, Jack Riley, who is about to turn three. In this week's episode, we're seeing it's a very special day in their household because mom is going to the hospital today to give birth to his little sister. So everybody's a little bit on edge, right? It's very exciting, but sometimes things that are exciting, we know this for ourselves too, are a little overwhelming. You're a little more emotional. You're a little more out of sorts. Well, why would it be any different for him? So he's having a little bit of a rough day today. He's kind of pushing the envelope, wants to have more control, um, which makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, but it's certainly so much easier to see it from the outside than from seeing it from the inside. Uh, but we see the therapist dealing with this non-compliance, if you will, because that really what it, that's what it is. She says to him, sit on the chair, and he says, no, sit on the floor. And she says, no, you got to sit on the floor. No, sit on the floor. And she has to back off just a little bit, and sometimes that's what we have to do to get compliance. Uh, it's really one of those things. I said this is a creative art. There's no always with all children, this is the answer, right? Um, but she's kind of feeling it out, and she kind of pulls back, and then he sits in the chair. Um, but he's, you know, he's contesting things. Our kids will. That's growth. That's growth. It really is. Um, but the therapist makes the point that we can't, we can't ever fail to follow through. Follow through is important. If any of you golf, you know this. <laughs> I don't golf, but I hear it all the time. The follow through is everything, right? Uh, and that's the truth for ABA and for parenting. So let's take a look at the A word. Do you think Jack knows what's happening today? Not a clue. We ask him where the baby was, and sometimes he points here, and sometimes he just points here and says belly button. <laughs> so he's either getting a baby sister or a belly button. He's not sure. Is she pink? Good. I love this one. Is she stitches? It's a, it's a wrister. Yeah. Another one? What potion? Sure, which one do you want? Both. Oh. Okay, here you go. Jessica gave Jack Riley a partial vocal prompt to get him to ask instead of demand the puzzle from her. Last week, she had to prompt him by saying, Say, can I? Hi, Kate. Sure. But now she only makes the sound to get him to ask. Eventually, he will need no prompting. Case. Case? Yes, I want case. Can I case? Yes, you can. There you go. Should we dance and sing? Should we say head, shoulders, knees, and toes? And he, yeah. Okay, let's sing the song first though. Sing, sing song first. Ready? Head. Dumbo. Head. Sing first and then Dumbo. Why? Sing first. Why? Now that Jack Riley has language, he negotiates with Jessica instead of tantruming or crying like he would have. I then ears and no and no could head shoulders knees and. Toes! Whoa! I am on eight there. <laughs> yeah, you finished the song. Okay, come here. Whee! Whoa! It's like you're Superman, huh? It's like you're Superman. Come here. Uh-uh. Jack Riley, come here. from um, other therapists that are on his team that he's been non-compliant when it comes to sitting in the chair. But right now it just seemed like he didn't want to do it because you asked him to do it, or I asked him to do it. And then I was 
prompting him to sit in the chair. But then once I just backed off, he sat on his own, like it's on his own terms, basically. But I didn't want him to get away with, if I asked him to do something, he has to do it. Um, and that applies to uh, when I ask him to do other things too, so that he doesn't um, um, learn that. If I just ask him something and don't follow through, then, oh, then I don't have to listen to Jessica. I'll just listen to her whenever I feel like it. Right. And he's been really exercising just because he can vocalize what he wants now. He wants it every time he asks for something. And then if you don't give it to him, then that's what happens. I do want him to learn that just because he asks nicely doesn't mean he'll get everything every time. Are you excited? Are you excited? He's sleeping. Are oh, you sleeping? <laughs> so what time are you going to leave, Mike? Uh, we're going to, what we have, OT at 11. Oh, you still have OT today? Yeah. Wow. Isn't it going to get closed? Yeah, well, that's the life of a, you know, that's our life now. Let's go back out. I'm going to go, uh, I got to go take around. a shower because we're going to have a baby. <laughs> See you later. Later. <laughs> Welcome back to Autism Live. We were just talking during the break about live theater and, um, you know, that's my background and I used to teach college, teach theater and um, I, if you have the opportunity as young as possible to take your child to see if that's something they like. My son loves when people tell him a story. He just, uh, you know, and I think it comes from having parents that have that background. My husband is still an actor and is very animated and uh, so we don't just read a story, we tell a story and uh, I was just saying that one of the things I want to do this summer is take my son to more live theater I took him to things when he was little even before autism showed up they still laugh about we took him to see um, a version of a Christmas Carol it was the Irish version uh, at the the Dubliners Playhouse here in Los Angeles and um, he was a year and a half and sat through the whole thing and just loved it and um, and we just this last weekend went to see a friend of mine a very good friend of mine in a show and uh, he stayed with grandma at home and he was very fatutzed about it and said I don't I don't understand why I can't go and I said because it's not appropriate for people your age and they have an age limit and then I went to it and and really he would have enjoyed it and he, you know the first thing the next morning when he woke up because we got home quite late and he said well how was it how was Auntie Teresa's play and I said Said, oh, it was wonderful. It was so funny. And he said, would I have liked it? And I said, yes, you really would have. And he said, well, then I get to go, right? And I said, no, the theater just doesn't allow people of your age <laughs> in to see the show. Well, why? Well, because there's some stuff in it that I think other kids would have a hard time sitting through. And he says, but I wouldn't. He And I think it's true. I think he would sit through the whole thing. And I, I really, I think part of it is just his individual personality. Um, but I also credit it with the fact that we made telling him stories, reading stories to him and interacting in that way with him important as early as possible. So it was really reinforcing for him very young. And and I've told before about how reading to him at night, I would put an, a cold apple in his hands. And that, I don't know why, was so reinforcing to his little individual personality. So when I say to you, it's so important to find out what is reinforcing to them and to not have judgments about it because, you know, I, like, I don't know how we discovered that with the apple. I think we went apple picking and, and you know, he had woolered one apple around forever and, and I was trying to get him to sit still and I said, give me the apple and you wouldn't help and he did. Um, you know, so don't give up. If you haven't found the thing that's reinforcing for your child, keep looking because some Sometimes it's a strange thing that you wouldn't imagine, but I really think that's why he loves the theater. I know in, in just a couple of weeks we're going to go see Peter Pan again. Oh, my goodness. We had, we'd seen the uh, videotaped version of it, uh, and that he watched that endlessly. The live uh, version of it was videotaped, and he watched that until the DVD about wore out and loved that when he was not feeling well. That was always the thing that he wanted. And then uh, last fall, we got to go see uh, a, a newer version, but it's the Kathy Rigby one, and that's what the videotape is of. And it was the Kathy Rigby one again, and it was the first time he had gotten to see it live. I had seen it live a lot of years ago, but oh, so magical, you guys. And he sat there and was just amazed. And it really, 
you know, on our journey, there were a lot of things that uh, I worried about. Were we ever going to get to this point and that point and whatever? And my son had been singing all the time before uh, autism came to live at our house. And then when autism came, the singing went away. And it really has been something that we've worked on and worked on and worked on, but it wasn't reinforcing to him. And and so I just, you know, I felt bad about it, but my heart kind of gave up on that. We still sang and we sang in the car and stuff, but he didn't, he would always choose not to participate. And I just just kind of gave up and then uh, and he would sing when he had to you know he had concerts in kindergarten and first grade and um, but he didn't particularly like it anymore and that really made me sad I had uh, whole things in his scrapbook when he was a baby when uh, everything was a microphone and he would sing constantly and make up songs and play his guitar and and say thank you thank you very much and then autism came and that all went away and he still liked music and he would still hum you know he's always done the score for it, but not words and not singing out and uh, then he went to see Peter Pan last fall and he got to go backstage afterwards and he got to meet Kathy Rigby I have pictures of it I should bring them in and the next morning oh, I'm gonna get all emotional but the next morning we woke up and heard him singing he was singing zippity doo -dah which I didn't even know that he knew zippity doo -da. And, uh, and I swear he hasn't stopped singing since last October. And it was the very week that they were uh, putting out the flyers saying that the, he was old enough in third grade that he could be a part of the school choir that met twice a week after school, prime video gaming time. And he said, no, I want to be in the choir. And he does all these performances now and sings constantly. And at the end of the year, they had a little mini talent show, very impromptu. There was no preparation for it, but they said, you know, does anybody want to get up and do anything? Do you have any talents that you do? And he got up and sang and danced for the class. And even the teacher said to me, okay, I was totally amazed because uh, it didn't seem like something he would have done. And he, But he got up and sang and danced did it all his little funky movements and um, very reinforcing for him because everybody was like wow you're such a good singer and dancer um, so sometimes those kinds of things uh, you know the gift of theater for him and of course his parents are thrilled <laughs> <laughs> that this is something that he finds reinforcing. It's not going to be for every child, but uh, it's so reinforcing for him. So, uh, you know, find the things that your kids love and don't give up. Because uh, I, I really had given up on the singing thing, and I'm so glad that it's back. Thanks to Kathy Rigby and Peter Pan. So we're going to see it. It's coming back to L.A. this month in a couple of weeks, and we're going to go see it again. And it's wonderful, you guys. Okay. Uh, if you get a chance, I know it's been touring around, and I think it's still touring. If you get a chance to see it, it really is magical. She flies out over the audience, literally over your heads, and sprinkles fairy dust. Uh, my husband, you know, he's a big kid too, but he, I had talked about it for years and said, oh, it's the most amazing thing when I saw it more than 10 years ago. And so he was prepared and said, okay, it's better than you said. <laughs> So you got to love that. That's pretty good. All right. Uh, so in any case, we just had seen the A word. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to remind you guys how important it is to be able to learn and accept emotionally where you are. And I think one of the things that's really going to help you is watching the A word, going back, watching the early episodes. You can watch all of them on YouTube. And as much as following the art of how this little boy is learning and how he's gaining all the skills that he is because he's really making leaps and bounds. I think it's equally important to watch the emotional journey that the parents go through. We just saw the dad, Mike, standing in the kitchen saying, yeah, I gotta go to OT. Yeah, because that's my life. Uh, it is, you know, and there is you're always going to have a little resentment about that because the person who's the next house over with five kids and none of them have this, you know, it's, it's not everybody's deal, but it sure is our deal and it's not easy. So I think following this emotional journey with them, I think it's cathartic. I love to watch it because it takes me back to those years and I get to process all the things that we went through and forgive myself for not always thinking woohoo, right? Because it can't always be woohoo. Certainly exciting things are happening and your child is learning, but it 
it's not easy not easy at all so watch the a word uh you'll learn you might cry a time or two you'll find yourself saying to them oh you're doing such a good job and it reminds us to say that to ourselves too right uh because i think we forget to do that but sometimes it's so much easier to see it on somebody else in any case they're a wonderful brave family they're doing a great job uh, and i know that all of you are doing a great job too let's take a break and when we come back we're going to look at the question of the day and how you guys explain autism to people when they ask you because i sure need some help there stick with us Welcome. I'm here today with Cecilia Knight, who is the Director of Training for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and today we're talking about how to keep kids healthy. I think it's really important for, of course, every child to have a pediatrician that the parent um, is comfortable with and that the parent is seeing regularly. Someone who's an expert on autism, who understands the issues related to autism. A lot of kids who are on the spectrum are a little bit obsessed with one area of food. Right. Any suggestions? I think it's really difficult for parents um, because many of their children either self-limit or they don't like certain textures. Mm -hmm. Their pediatricians, you know, after testing them, see that they are deficient um, in iron and other nutrients that are so important. And so it does reach um, the levels where many parents need to seek help. Um, maybe from something like SOS, Specialized Outpatient Services, or um, another feeding clinic in their area. Someone who can address specifically, how do I get my child to eat this texture? How do I get my child um, to eat something other than french fries? So what advice do you have for parents in terms of realizing what's the autism and right. what's something else that has to be addressed. As we all know, every child is different. Mm -hmm. And from one child to the next on the spectrum, their symptoms are different and what they struggle with uh, medically is different. Um, you do run to, into a problem with many physicians saying, well, oh, well, that's just symptomatic of autism and so we're not going to treat it. And I think it's really important um, to be sure that if they need to see a neurologist to address seizures, that they're getting that done. Um, if they need to see a nutritionist because of the food issues that they're getting that done, all while being treated by a pediatrician who maybe can help oversee that. But I, I think it's not a great idea to dismiss everything as that's just autism. Mm -hmm. I always try to imagine a child trying to do therapy while they've got all these biological things going on and, right. and how could they possibly concentrate? Right. Well, you know, our clients are just like you and I. Um, you know, it's very difficult to concentrate if I have a headache or if I have an upset stomach. And so I think it's really important to um, first give the child the opportunity to feel better whatever that means for that child because again each child is very different um, but I have had children that once you address a specific food allergy then the symptoms of stomach pain or you know a sty in their eye that wouldn't go away or constant diarrhea until we addressed that medical issue it's very difficult to concentrate on treatment sure and then once they could address those issues then treatment um, you know went more the way we were hoping it would go absolutely and there's all kinds of things that would come under that heading right if they had sleep disorders sure. um, if there's we already said food allergies but um, what about vision problems absolutely um, you know, the hard thing is, um, depending on the child's ability to communicate, sometimes it's difficult to have vision tested or to have hearing tested. So working in combination with someone who could help um, expose the child to the contingencies that would be in place, for example, um, for vision tests and practicing or being prepared um, may help in those situations, but it's definitely a real issue. Wow. So maybe even using your ABA program to practice right. for the vision test. Right. It's very difficult for parents to find a pediatrician often who that they connect with, but I think I encourage them to keep looking for a pediatrician who has um, 
specific experience and has um, other clients maybe with autism and they have a good rapport with other parents. Someone who can listen to their concerns about sleep or about seizures or about eating and not dismiss them. Right. Um, because, you know, sometimes we uncover things that are surprising or that were unexpected, just like with the rest of us. So it's important to keep looking for answers, I think, to all of those issues. And the healthier they are, the happier they're going to be, and the quicker they're going to learn. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to Autism Live. It's time, one of my favorite times of the day, for viewer response to our question of the day. Our question of the day today was, how do you explain autism to people when they ask you about it? And I uh, have some really interesting responses here. Somebody who wrote in said, good question. My oldest, thank you, by the way. Uh, my oldest is autistic, so I get that question asked to me all the time, and I tell them that it's a neurological disorder, and not only kids can be on the spectrum but adults too which you know I don't ever think to say that to people that it's not just kids and really you know it's pretty important that I should be adding that in another person who wrote in and said I explain what autism is yeah but how do you do that that's what I want to know and how many it affects and describe early warning signs and how important it is to have early intervention and hand out resources and where to seek treatment in their area and of course that is really you know, what that made me think about is that how important it is to say what the early warning warning signs are because uh, I don't know why that never occurs to me because usually when somebody asks me, it, they're not just asking to ask. Usually it's because they have a child in their life that they've started to question, do, is this something that I need to be more aware of? And I'm always... Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, of course, we know autism is so prevalent, but I just have accepted that this is part of uh, this is part of my journey for sure, because even though my son is at the point where, you know, I, honestly, in my day to day life, it probably wouldn't come up much except that I do this now. Um, but wherever I go, where ever I go. I, I just have to sit back and wait and I don't have to say autism ever and somebody comes up to me and somehow something gets said and the A word comes up and they'll say, oh, you know, I have a child or I have a friend or I have a, a sister-in-law or I have uh, a child in my classroom and, and I always think, of course you do. Of course you do because this is the way I'm experiencing my life right now. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's always amazing to me how it comes around to that, but there are so many people out there who have questions and don't know where to go to get them answered. So they are going to ask us, they're going to ask us. And usually it is because they're worried about somebody. Uh, another person who wrote in to meet one person with autism is to only meet one person with autism, that that's what they say. And I think that that's a really important, I had some more on the other site. Uh, hang on one second and we'll go there and take a look um, that uh, another person said um, God gave us a special boy to help raise the connections in his brain may be a little different than ours we are ready for this challenge today one day at a time what a wonderful thing to say out loud for yourself we are ready for this challenge today which doesn't mean you know we're ready for this challenge for the rest of our lives but we're ready for this challenge today what a positive thing i'm going to adopt that um another person says i don't explain because i shouldn't have to but I tell people if they want to understand what we go through as children and parent, I ask them to watch Rain Man. Now that's interesting to me because that isn't what I would do, but you know, we all do our different things. And that she says if they don't get it after that, feh. Um, it's spelled F-E-H. That's what fe. <laughs> um, so that's really interesting to me because that wouldn't be my go to to explain Rain Man. But, you know, um, different people, different things. Another person says, I tell them smart. And funny I love that um, although you know a lot of times then people go well then why does why do you need so much money and you know then I go into well 
you know, here are the reasons why. Um, another person says, I love when people ask me about my son. Anything to help make them understand him better. I normally ask them to ask more specific questions and try to assure them that questions don't offend me. I love that. Another person says, I have autism. Even though it is hard to tell that I have it, but when people ask me what autism is, I just tell them that it just means that it's nothing more than a gift given to us and that autistic people aren't different from everyone else. Very fun. Uh, another person who says they have a different but wonderful way to process information. We should all learn more about them and share love the way they do. They are a blessing in our lives. How fabulous. Uh, another person says, my son says, I'm a bull in a china shop, LOL. Love that. And another person who like me is like Rain Man uh, and saying, but you know, then we have to explain to them that not all, all of our kids are that way. But again, everybody's entitled to their way. Love this one. It's a long roller coaster ride with multiple gaps in between that need lots of patience, love, and understanding to cope and deal with everyday's expectations and or dilemmas. Acceptance is the key to our journey. I think that's true. And they write, our son is now 25 years old with multiple disabilities and the autism in him stands out the most. My husband and I have had a lot of scary moments at times with our son, but we just look at each other and smile and hope for the best. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, the fact that you're still in it together and smiling about it and you're having a lot of scary moments, uh, that's brilliant. Well, it's different for all of us. There's more, but uh, we don't really have time. Uh, but when we, we're going to take a break and when we come back, we have the social tip of the week, which is about self-esteem. We've been talking this week about bullying with Evelyn Gould and that was Wednesday's show. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I really urge you to watch that on Blip or on YouTube or on iTunes and catch up on that because she said some really amazing things about how we can help our children in a, a lots of different ways that make them less likely to be bullied and more likely if they are bullied to be able to cope with it in a better way. Um, and one of those things was working on self-esteem. So we're going to talk about that. And then we have the myth of the day, which I'm really excited to talk about in particular today. And then at the top of the hour, yeah, it's Friday at 11 o'clock, we're going to have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox to talk about research. Uh, and I hope that you guys have your questions ready for him. All right, stick with us. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. I'm Monique Erickson. I'm a senior supervisor here at CARD in the training department. How can we make a non-preferred outing, someplace that the child doesn't want to go, be less stressful and not be a battle? Well, when you're looking at planning some of these outings to places that are a little more difficult for our kids, there's a lot of things you need to think about going in. And I think one of the first things you need to do is uh, have a realistic expectation. It's going to be difficult, and it's not going to be something that you might be able to do right off the bat. You know, there's some work that goes into that and a lot of steps that go into that. Um, you, you're going to want to look back and, and, and look at the behaviors. What's happening in this outing? Why is it so difficult? What, where does it break down? Do we not even get through the front door? Is that the problem? Or um, do we get through the front door and then my child has an agenda that doesn't match mine? Um, and that's what we need to work on. Uh, I've had lots of families um, where we've worked on this. This is definitely an area that we work on in our programs. And for example, I have one little boy where we couldn't even get through the front door. So that's what we practiced. Um, and you had to have the expectation that you knew you weren't going to the store to shop this time. We were gonna go and we were gonna practice this thing. Um, this, this behavior of entering for whatever reason was difficult for him, that that's what we were gonna practice and reinforce and take baby steps to this, to this um, this in behavior called grocery shopping that had all these little baby steps along the way and just remember that it, it's it's it is difficult that you have to step back and do all these steps to get there but you will get there um, and you're not going to get there if you don't practice it and do it so you have to get out there and do it as much as um, it may be difficult to be in the community and having these kind of meltdowns and these difficult behaviors with people around 
Um, you have to practice these skills to get them better. So it, it's important to do that. So um, for this little guy, we, we did just that. We took it from day, you know, step one, he couldn't get through the door. We practiced that until that got better, and then we took on the next step. And eventually, he was able to participate in their grocery shopping. Um, you know, not to say that it was an hour and it was perfect. Um, it was more realistic. They had a few things on their list. They, he, he was able to go through, help get these things, and then they, they went on their way. So, but that took a lot of work and a lot of steps getting up to that, that point. So what are some strategies for going to a big shopping center like a Walmart? Some strategies just in general to keep in mind is, um, you know, do you need some visual supports? Do you need some kind of visual thing like, first we're going to do this and then we're going to do this? Sometimes that's really helpful for our kids just to know what to expect. Okay, this isn't going to last forever. We're just going to do a few things and then we get to leave this place and do something else. And that sometimes will help just alleviate that that frustration that they, they don't really know what to expect. How long is this going to be? Um, and so sometimes that visual support c could help. Um, you want to practice this realistically. You can, like, you don't go from um, never having these outings to an hour. So you're building up systematically to these longer um, outings so that eventually you get to a point of some duration that you can actually do something functional in that. You can actually get some items in the store and <laughs> when you go there versus just practicing a couple minutes here and there. Um, so, so I think those are some things you want to think about early on. If you're going to that bigger store, um, you know, I think f for our kids, helpful to, depending on their, where their skill level is, and if you're practicing, this, practicing these skills, hopefully you can kind of give them, like, this is what's going to happen. This is, this is what um, the rules are kind of thing. This is what you're, you know, if you can do X, Y, and Z when they're in there, this is what will happen kind of thing. Kind of be very... Um, concrete and, and give them an idea. Okay, we're going to go in and we're going to do this and if you do this, this will happen. This is the behavioral contingency in place. If you don't, then we're going to need to leave and this will happen kind of thing. But be very clear so that the, it's kind of like the rules are on the table. It's fair game. <laughs> you know, like we're going in, this is what's going to happen and this is how it will be. When you're looking at sto uh, stores like Walmart, very loud, lots of stuff going on, um, I think just prepare yourself and be realistic about that. Is it going to be overstimulating? Can your child handle that? Do you need to take baby steps going into those bigger environments? Um, maybe know exactly where you, what you need from that store. If you really need to do a lot of browsing and just taking your time, maybe is there a time that you will have an opportunity to not have to bring them with you for that and, um, and only bring them when you have a, a specific agenda, like I'm going in for these items, we're going to get them and we're going to leave. So those are some things I would keep in mind when you're doing that. What kinds of reinforcement should we give for doing a good job on an outing? When you're doing these outings, uh, something that is really important, it's, well, it's important no matter what we're teaching, but definitely when you're out in, this com in the community and you're doing these type of outings that they're, they're not preferred from our kids, you want to make sure you're always reinforcing those behaviors we want to see more of. That's the, the, you know, the cornerstone to what we do. You, know, you reinforce the behaviors you want to see more of so they keep happening, and that's got to happen when you're in those community settings. So when, you, when the child is attending and he's uh, sitting there quietly or helping you, um, you know, gather things in the store if that's what you're working on, you make sure you're praising and reinforcing them um, so that they know that this is a behavior we want to see more of. That may be, um, for some of our earlier learners, that may not just be verbal praise. It may have to be a tangible um, to get them through that, that you know, situation. So it could be a little snack here and there to reinforce them and keep them on track. Like, oh, you're doing a great job. That's so good. I like the way you're sitting so quietly and waiting for mommy. You know, here's a little snack or something like that. So you might need something like that for those little ones that are early on in, the, in, in that experience. Or maybe you can just get to verbal praise at some point. Just depends on the learner, but you definitely want to keep them reinforced during that whole experience. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. I want to remind all of you that at 6 p.m. today, it's Friday, uh, June 15th, I had to think about that for a second, at 6 p.m. Central Time today, the Speed Gamers are starting their Marathon Pokemon fundraiser f to raise money for autism care and treatment today. A wonderful organization, a non profit that 
gives grants to families all over for the things that they need. How wonderful is that? You know, I, I think it's great anytime somebody has something to give and donate to autism. Um, but you know, there are times when you need something specific, whether it is that you need an iPad or other kind of notebook device, or you need a fence, or you need money for assessment, or you need money for the gap that you have to pay for insurance before you've met your deductible. Uh, autism Care and Treatment offers an opportunity for families to request a grant for the thing that they need. And that's a wonderful thing that we should all be supporting. Unfortunately, though, in order to make those grants a reality, they have to have people donate. And Speed Gamers is one of their biggest single uh, donation sources. This is a group of young people who get together, play a game uh, once a year online for a period of days, a marathon, day and night, and people can log on to their site and donate money or throw in a challenge for money. And that money this weekend goes to Autism Care and Treatment Today. They, in the past, have raised more than $50,000, and we're hoping that they're going to break a record this weekend. They've already, they haven't even started, and they've already raised $1,000, which is pretty amazing. If you have a dollar to give or something more to give, then you're going to want to log on and watch and support at www.thespeedgamers.com. If you don't have a dollar to give, please do not feel bad about that. I understand, you know, you're working with a child on the spectrum, and sometimes you don't have a dollar to give, but please support them by logging on to www.thespeedgamers.com and post it on your Facebook, post it on, tweet about it. Uh, use your social marketing that you have, your social networking to let other people know about it because I guarantee somebody you know has a dollar to give. And you know what? That adds up. It really, really does. So let's support the Speed Gamers because they're making it possible to give those grants. Uh, and I hear it's fun. I can't wait to see. I know my son, they're playing Pokemon this weekend. And uh, I think that my both my I don't know how if my husband will be interested in Pokemon, but usually he's interested in the gaming thing. Uh, so, but I expect that my son will like it. So hopefully your children will too. Uh, and even if you just put it on for a few minutes, it helps them out. www.thespeedgamers.com. And by the way, you can go to the Act Today website, check out what they do, and they have a link to it there too. That's act-today.org. So check it out and support them. It's that time of the week when we give a social skills tip of the week. And we had Evelyn Gould in the studio the other day talking specifically about bullying and what kinds of things we can do to help our child when, uh, when bullying has happened in the, and to prevent it. And one of the things, and it's hard to hear, right? None of us wants to hear this. None of us wants this to be the truth of the world. but the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes our kids are significantly different, which leaves them vulnerable to bullying. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish, you know, and I and I hate to even talk about it in terms of that, but it's the truth, right? And we have to deal in truths. And there are things that we're working on with our children anyway, and if we can help them um, to be less vulnerable to a bully, then we really need to focus on that, right? And especially if it's something that helps them with other skills as well. And we talked about self-esteem and, and how to behave in a way that you're not as vulnerable to a bully. That's not the only thing we're going to do, right? We're going to work with our schools to educate those kids so that they're not picking on our kids, right? There has to be a level of acceptance. But we also want to help our children to deal with it when it does happen. And one of the things that is essential that we help our children with is working on self-esteem and part of self-esteem that we can work very young with small children is making positive self statements <sighs> right this is important for us to model too you might be having a really hard time and you, you know the economy is bad and getting work is as hard and your child is struggling and you might find yourself making some negative self statements well important for us to model it saying thinking about what are your strengths, what do you have going for you, um, and making positive out loud statements about it. This is not bragging, there's a difference between bragging and making a positive self statement, but knowing what you're good at. How important is that in life and saying, I'm a good parent. And you know, and even as I say to go, oh, well, you know, it depends on the day, right? Right, we all go there in our heads. But 
um, being able to say it out loud, uh, model that for your child and teaching them how to make positive self statements. Whether it's something if your child is not vocal, whether it's something that they're typing or writing or thinking or signing or gesturing to. Um, that, you know, if you say, you know, Jake is really good at video games and they give a thumbs up because they're Jake and they know that they are good, at, but having that as part of the repertoire. This is something, you know, we know that it's important for any behavior to be maintained. It has to be reinforcing, right? And it's like a little reward that's spaced e evenly and equally throughout the day that we're reminding ourselves we're doing a good job and having our children remind themselves that they're doing a good job. You know, um, recently I was having a conversation with my son and, uh, you know, he was struggling because uh, one of the kids in his class had been picking on him and telling him that he always messed everything up, that he was stupid and that he always messed it up and that he always wrecked everything. And so my son, who had been making positive self statements, uh, turned into this thing. He was like, well, you know, I stink and I suck at this and I wreck everything and I ruin everything. And his self-esteem just plummeted. And I was really freaked out about it because I was saying, but you're awesome. And you know what he said to me? He's at that age and he was like, well, you're my mom. Of course you would say that. And I had that scary moment when I realized, and we all need to at some point, I can't give him that self-esteem anymore. It has to come from himself. And I realized I hadn't done enough work. We'd done this before, but I hadn't been keeping up on it. You got to maintain on things. And so every day, instead, I'm asking him a question and saying, what are you good at? What are you good at? And he says, well, you know, I'm really good at playing this video game. And I go, that's right. You're fabulous at that. And then I'll ask him, what else? What else that doesn't have to do with video games? And that's one of the ways with an old your child that we can build that self-esteem um, is by asking them a question that they have to answer. So they say, well, I'm good at, um, well, by the way, I'm really good at this. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll say to him, you know, what, uh, what are like three great things about you? I'm talking to a friend of mine and I said this, this, and this, but what are three great things that you think about you? So now I've gotten the opportunity to compliment him on three things, but he has to come up with three things too. Really important for our kids because, you know, I can, it's that thing about teach a man to fish and you've taught him how to take care of himself for the rest of his life give the man the fish and he's just going to eat for the day. And I don't want my son to just have self-esteem for the day. I want him to have it forever. So I have to put the impetus of him knowing what he's good at and building his own self-esteem because I'm just his mom. Oh, he's like, of course you think I'm wonderful mom because you're my mom. Oh, my heart bleeding. But uh, I do. I think he's incredible. Um, but that's not going to get it done. He has to do it for himself. But really important that we model this as well. It's important for you to have self-esteem and to model what it is like to have self-esteem for your child. It's good for you too. And you are doing a good job. So I'm going to ask you, what are you doing that's really good. What are you good at? And say it out loud, own it and say it in front of your child so that they see that it's okay to say, I'm good at something really, really super duper important for them. Okay. We got to take a break. When we come back, it's time for the myth of the day. And it's one that I haven't taken on and I'm really excited to take this one on. It's been a topic that's on, been on the top of my mind for a while. And then at the top of the hour, we are going to have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox with us. And he is the head of research Research and development. We call it Research Fridays. Really excited to have him with us, so stay tuned. Act Today, or Autism Care and Treatment Today, was founded in 2004 by several passionate parents who believe that access to early, effective treatment is vital for individuals with autism. Together with Dr. Doreen graham Pache, the world's leading provider of therapy for autism, this group created ACT Today to do just as the name implies, take action immediately to treat autism spectrum disorders. 
A lot of families and parents and even uh, physicians don't yet accept the fact that we are recovering children with autism. In 2006, inspired by her struggle to get treatment for her young son Wyatt, television producer and author Nancy Allspot Jackson and her husband Reed hosted a backyard benefit for the foundation called Denim and Diamonds for Autism. Tens of thousands of dollars were raised, and in 2008, Allspot Jackson took the helm of Act Today as executive director. We have, this country has to come together to save a generation of children. With a dedicated board of directors, a small but committed staff called the A-Team, as in autism, ACT Today is making a huge difference in the lives of children across the country. Grants that fund programs for behavior therapy, special needs schools and summer camps, medical needs like diagnostic tests and special diets, basic safety equipment such as helmets for children who repetitively bang their heads, and fencing for those who wander, assisted technologies and assistance dogs. Hi, my name is Max and I love my iPad too. It's so great, I can take photos, in 2010, Act for Military Families became the first national campaign to benefit military children with autism. I'm Joe Montagna. As a father of a daughter with autism, I know the challenges that brings. Act Today continues to educate and raise national awareness on the need for early and intensive intervention for an epidemic that affects at least one in 110 children. I called on November 1st. And I'm like, how am I going to get notified? How are you going to let me know? And they ended up looking and they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. Act Today, fulfilling its mission of helping families with autism, one child at a time. Shannon Penrod, the host of Skills Live. And in honor of back to school, I've got a little project that you can do at home that will give your child a clear idea of what they're working for at school and help you to keep track of what they're doing. There are a couple of different elements to this project, and I want to show you first how it works and then how to do it yourself. So this element of the project stays at home. And what it says is, what are you working for today? So my son can look at this, and I like to give him five choices, but you can customize this for your child at whatever point they're at. Five choices might be overwhelming to them, or they might need more choices, but you can put as many of these tags on as you want. And some of the things that I know that he likes that he might want to work for are video games, being able to swim after school, a toy. We like to get the little Happy Meal toy from McDonald's. You know, you can buy it without getting a Happy Meal and he likes to work for Microsoft points, we're at that point in the game, and a play date, he likes to work for a play date. And I can, these are Velcroed on so that I can switch them and put other things on. So this will hang in my kitchen and each morning before he goes to school, he'll pick one and say, this is what I wanna work for today. I made it colorful because he likes that kind of thing, but you could make it all in the same color if you wanted to do that. So he would pick this one off and say, I want to work for Microsoft Points today, and this gets added to his little schedule. On the back of it, it just Velcros right on so that he can remind himself that's what he's working for, and his teacher can know that that's what he's working for today. And I broke up his day into the morning, recess, mid-morning, lunch, and afternoon. You'll notice that there's a sixth area. This is for his behavior. This is just for getting work done and paying attention, but this is for behavior, and he can be on green, yellow, or red. And my yellow and red stickers are there, so if his behavior was not being very good, this would come off, go back onto the Velcro, and he would need to put the yellow sticker on. When he was younger, he would have somebody else maintaining this for him, but now he's maintaining it himself. Um, also, there are stars and little tool symbols. So if he, at the end of the morning, if he feels that he has done a good job, he would rip one of these off the Velcro, don't you love Velcro, and put it right onto the morning like that, so he would know that he did a good job. 
if he felt that he didn't do a great job, and again, it's that self-monitoring that he's at before it was somebody doing it for him, but if he felt he didn't, need to, didn't do a good job and he needed to work on it, then he would put the little tool symbol on. I didn't want to put a frowny face because I just want him to know that it's something to work on. And our deal is, at the start of this school year, that if he gets three stars out of the five, then he gets whatever he was working for at the end of the day. Although he does have to stay on green. By the time he gets home, he's got to be on green. So he knows, and this is a really a small one, so that he can look and chart his progress for the day, know what he's working for, and that when I pick him up from school, I have a clear idea of how he did. And if I start to see that he's constantly needing to work on things for recess, then I know there might be something to talk about with him or with the teacher. Um, it's a really good way of keeping track of things. So how do you make this? It's really simple. I've made it a little bit more complicated because I want it to last. Um, so I laminated it, and but the Velcro is really an essential thing. That's the biggest cost in this is the Velcro. You don't even have to use a computer if you don't want to, but if you want to use the computer, all I did was I went on Google and I searched for a scrapbook tag template. And I popped that in and I could make a text box in it and I could fill the text box with whatever I wanted. Um, so that was simple. This was just a, uh, a text box that I, that I put in, but I could have done it by hand. And I did this on cardstock and the rest of the paper is just regular paper. And as I said, I did it in different colors. So you can see on this piece of paper that I stacked my templates with my text boxes and then I just cut them out individually. And I have here a sheet of laminate, laminating film. So I laid things out that I cut. Here are the little stars and I can just stick them on the little green dot or red dot. It's sticky. So I can stick those right on and of course I want to use as much of the paper as I can. Then I would peel another sheet of laminating, slap it on the top, cut them out. I have my handy little sticky dots for Velcro. On this one, when it got to where on the back to put all of the stickers, I put strips of Velcro. You could do that in, on both sides and just cut them out, but this was super duper easy to just peel off a piece of the Velcro and slap it right onto the thing. And it will last, and it also is functional so that if I wanted to only have three things on here, I could. And I can change these out if I decide that these aren't being gratifying enough. I could change them to Star Wars or anything that your child likes. Um, and I can also automatically change this that as he progresses in the coming weeks, I can then start saying to him, oh, now you have to get four stars in order to get the thing on the back and eventually say five stars. And to work towards generalization, I want to keep making this smaller and smaller. For right now, he's going to keep it on his desk. But eventually, I would have an icon on the desk that would let him know that only during breaks to pull it out and take a look at it. And in that way, I'm starting to be able to fade all of this out. You can do this for your child at home, and probably the whole project takes less than 45 minutes, and it'll last a really long time, and it's adaptable. So a great project to track your child's progress. And I'm sticking to my lamination sheets. It can get messy, but it's really fun to do. So good luck back to school, and hopefully this will be helpful to you. Thanks. Welcome back to Autism Live. I just got to meet Jack Riley for the very first time, and he's so cute on the A word, and he's cuter in person. He's just awesome. So I'm a little starstruck at the moment because I just met Jack Riley. And of course, I met his parents too, and his baby sister. So very exciting. And uh, we look forward to maybe sometime having them live on the show, mom and dad. Because uh, really awesome, awesome people. If you're not watching the A word, you sure should be because uh, it's amazing. 
amazing. All right, it's time for the myth of the day. And uh, this is one that we have not taken on before, but it was something that I found myself talking about yesterday. Our question of the day was, how do you explain autism to people? And you know that when people ask you about autism, there's a whole host of questions that they uh, will ask. And um, one of the things that I was saying to the person that I was talking to, I said, you know, the important thing to know about autism, I think, is that it isn't just autism, that we've gotten to the point where I think everybody recognizes that it's autisms with the S on the end of it, uh, that there isn't just one type of autism. That's a myth that's out there that, oh, well, there's autism. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that it appears to be that there are many different types of autism and that it starts in a different way, that it has a different progression, um, and that one size will not fit all for our kids. And, and I don't know, I hope it's not offensive, but one of the ways that I like to explain it to people is that, you know, back in my great grandmother's day, they had the word cancer, right? And cancer stood for any time that there was something in your body that started to grow that wasn't typical and was preventing parts of your body from working, right? They didn't think of it as lung cancer, and they didn't think of it as liver cancer, and they didn't think of it as brain cancer. It was just cancer. And by the way, when they were treating it, they started just doing the same thing for all the different types of cancer. And eventually they realized, no, you know, there's brain cancer, there's liver cancer, there's lung cancer, right? And they started treating each of those things in a different way because they responded in a different way. And then eventually we got to the point in the last 50 years where now somebody gets diagnosed with cancer and they say this is type you know 31a lung cancer it's small cell fast growing which means it's going to respond to this and this is statistically what we know is how we treat this particular type of cancer and they continue to get it more and more perfected to the point where it, it isn't this mixed bag trial and error kind of thing that they're doing for cancer anymore. It's very specific and they've done research on it and know with this particular type of cancer, this is what works. Well, we need to get to that point with autism, don't we? Um, and when you hear people talk about phenotyping autism, and I don't completely understand that, and maybe that's something that we can act, ask Dr. Jonathan Tarbox in just a few minutes, but we want to get to the point, and I do understand this is apparent, where we can look at something and say this particular type of autism requires this many hours of ABA, it requires this kind of attention, it, it occurs in, in these circumstances, at this age range, we need to look for it in this way, um, and when we get to that point, it's going to be an awesome, awesome day in the history of autism. So, but I think until we get to that day, we all need to be aware of the fact that all of our kids are different, that they have different circumstances, they come into the arena of autism at different times with different skill abilities, uh, with different deficits, and we don't ever want to look at them as just autism one color, right? It's a huge spectrum and it requires a lot of different attention. And that's one of the reasons why I love ABA and speak about ABA is that it is something that we can use no matter where they are on the spectrum and that we will see progress. For all of our kids, it's going to be different. They're all going to end up in different places, but there is still progress to be had. Um, but in my wish list of things in my lifetime, I hope that we're able to phenotype autism and really be able to get so much more efficient about saying, here's what we know is effective and this is what we need to do for this child and not not be in this case of saying, I don't know where we're going to end up, right? Um, so remember phenotyping autism. It's something that we're going to talk about from time to time on the show and hopefully uh, begin to be able to tell you what you can do to help us to work towards that day. Won't that be awesome? All right, we have to take a break. Uh, but when we come back, we are going to have the wonderful and awesome Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. It is Research Fridays, so stick with us. Skill 
Tools is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does Skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly Add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you. Welcome back to Autism Live. It's Friday, Research Friday, so we're welcoming the fabulous Dr. Jonathan Tarbox to the studio. And it's so great to have you back again. Always good to be back. I canceled on you last week. I apologize for that. Right. Um, but we have you here today. It's been a while because it we were at the conference, well. and uh, so, so wonderful to have you back. If you haven't watched the show before when Dr. Tarbox has been on, he is the head of research and development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and he's a wonderful resource. If you have a question, now is a really good time if you're watching us live you can just type it into the question box and send it over to us if you're watching and we're not live you can email you can Facebook you can Twitter you can tweet away whatever it is that you want to do because even if it, you're watching a rebroadcast we we have Dr. Tarbox come in every Friday and we know where he works yeah. so we can find him and it is part of our mission here at CARD is to get information out there to parents mm -hmm. research-based information on what works what doesn't work and other resources um, as well as autism research group our nonprofit 
uh, of which I'm the executive director, that's one of our major missions, mm -hmm. is get information on scientifically proven treatment out there. Uh, so yeah, if, if people have questions about wor what works, uh, what doesn't work, or just want uh, research information on anything related to autism, they should email us and we can see what we can do to help. Okay, and I have to say, you know, he's not just saying that. Anytime I've come to you and said, okay, we have a parent with a question, you are just, you know, so willing and you get excited, okay. actually. You know, well, quite the opposite of what you would expect, but he gets excited and says, oh, that's a great question and you're always interested in, in helping. And Well, it's literally part of my job, so, and I like it, so. So there great. you go, wonderful. Um, and we were just talking about the myth of the day and talking about autism versus autisms and the whole idea of phenotyping autism. And I said, you know, we actually do have somebody who knows what they're talking about because uh, I don't completely get it I don't pretend to completely get it but I I get it around the edges and I know how important it is so maybe you can explain sure. so that I actually do get it what is phenotyping autism sure so the general idea behind phenotypes is that there are um, different subgroups so phenotype basically just means a subclass or subgroup within an overall group so um, the idea is there are different subgroups within overall autism spectrum disorders we already know there's um, autism PDD NOS and Asperger's although the distinction between those isn't entirely clear. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of gray area, as we all know, um, between those. Um, but we also all acknowledge that, uh, you know, the old saying, when you've met one kid with autism, you've met one kid with autism, right? right. So within the overall autism spectrum disorders, there's a huge amount of variability. Um, but there does appear to be some sort of clusters or some mm -hmm. sort of subgroups within all of the variability. Um, very few of these have actually been proven by research yet or really um, well described by research, but there's a number of research groups in a number of different areas um, trying to do this. The basic rationale is, what, well, why would we want to know, right, uh, what the different subgroups are? The basic rationale is there's probably something different going on with these different subgroups. Um, so I can just sort of um, talk about some off the top of my head. Okay. Um, a major distinction that we look at in early intensive behavioral intervention is in response to treatment. Mm -hmm. And so there does seem to be some kind of difference between children who respond particularly well and rapidly mm -hmm. to ABA intervention versus those who are more moderate learners. And so mm -hmm. they still, everyone responds. There, there are right. no zero responders. Um, that would be equivalent to saying uh, an organism can't learn, which is ridiculous. Um, but there is a difference difference in rate of response and so um, we're very interested in what that difference is. Uh, not just so that we can give treatment only to the high responders but quite the opposite actually so that we can figure out how to adjust our treatment mm -hmm. to make it more effective for the kids who respond more slowly. Right, which is amazing. Yeah, well it's, it's a big uh, big task to undertake. We haven't made much progress on it yet but we're working on it. But I think as a parent, you know, especially in the early days whenever I would hear somebody talking about their child with autism and they would describe, you know, how they discovered their child had autism and I was always hanging on the end of my seat saying and it was very quick I could say oh that's not my child right. or oh that's my child mm -hmm. and if it was my child I was always particularly interested to hear what had they done right absolutely. you know and so what worked and and you know and over and over again of course mm -hmm. what I heard was ABA uh -huh. ABA uh -huh. ABA ABA and and of course you know for all of our kids like you said there's going to be progress but uh, I, it just made me that much more interested in getting started with ABA ABA. Well, of course, that's every parent's first thing that they think of is, okay, who else has a situation like mine? Yeah. Whose children are similar to mine? And of course, every, every child's different. But, you know, another big um, difference that we see or, uh, you know, another big hunch we have is kids for whom um, sort of visual stimuli are really mm -hmm. important and or auditory stimuli maybe are really challenging. And mm -hmm. so uh, a term that's thrown around sometimes is visual learners. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really know the scientific basis for that term, but I have made a clinical observation and a lot of folks have, mm -hmm. that there does seem to be a difference between mm -hmm. kids who just respond incredibly well to treatment when you really embed lots of visual supports mm -hmm. into treatment versus other kids who really don't need that. And that's maybe just not, um, not a very salient uh, source mm -hmm. of stimulation for them in their environment. Um, children who are um, hyperlexic, mm -hmm. who, who uh, respond incredibly well to um, letters and words. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we've seen children with autism who are pretty severely impaired in language in general and yet can teach themselves to read, yeah. which is very strange, it's interesting, right? It's interesting. Yeah. 
Um, and so what's the difference? What's going on there? Is it just yeah. a difference in behavioral repertoire? Is there something else going on? Right. But more importantly, what can we do about that to right. make treatment more effective and to support these folks better? We just the other day showed uh, a TED Talk with Temple Grandin, mm -hmm. and she likes to separate things into those categories too. She says visual learners and uh, more conceptual learners, and, uh, and it was through one of her talks that I realized, because I'm a visual person, mm -hmm. but my son is more conceptual. And that sometimes when I was trying to convey something to him, I would frustrate him to the point of... Because you're doing of, it more visually and he doesn't get that or yeah. it's not getting through. And, yeah, and so I would explain things. And even yesterday, I was giving somebody directions to get someplace. And I don't look at the street signs. I go, well, you want to go down to that red store <laughs> and take a left? And they would go, what kind of directions are these? Yeah, and that's how I would that. try to teach my son. And he needed the whole concept first. So I have to remind myself when I teach him something new, here's the whole thing. And then I can take it apart into smaller visual things and then he can handle the way I talk. Got it. Yeah. And so he can sense. communicate. He and I can communicate. But I hadn't that had not occurred to me before she said that. I just thought everybody was visual. Well, and it's interesting too because some ABA folks don't like the whole visual versus auditory versus conceptual mm -hmm. distinction because they think it's kind of creating um, sort of a made-up explanation for why maybe your treatment is or isn't working that mm -hmm. isn't very useful. But, but it actually is analyzable in ABA terms because all it's doing is pointing to different aspects of the environment mm -hmm. that tend to be particularly important for that individual. And so it's maybe not as reinforcing. Though, it's that's more re exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, more a more reinforcing. B uh, just the individual attends to those types of stimuli mm -hmm. more, they're mm -hmm. more interested in them, uh, they're more salient. Uh, so uh, it actually fits very well with an ABA perspective because all it does is point towards which aspects of the environment you can harness to make the kid learn more effectively. Yeah. And you know, no one's saying that a visual learner can't learn auditorily or vice versa, right. that's ridiculous. Right. Um, but it may well be that learning occurs a little bit more easily uh, in one right. modality versus another. Which would be a really beneficial thing to it know, would be as, nice a to know. as a parent, as a teacher. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to take a little break, and when we come back, uh, Dr. Tarbox has a really inspirational story that he's going to share with us that I'm excited to hear more about. So stick with us back in just a few minutes. I'm Adele Nadowski, director and co-creator of Skills. Card eLearning is an online tool that has been developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Card eLearning is the training that is delivered to the ABA therapists at CARD to train them on the principles of applied behavior analysis and to equip them with the knowledge they need to essentially deliver the ABA-based techniques during their therapy with the children that they work with. ABA has been proven scientifically to be the most effective intervention for children with autism. At this point, even the Surgeon General has come out with a statement suggesting just that. So we know that this is something that children with autism definitely need if they're going to improve and um, live the lives that we're hoping that they're going to be able to live. By being able to train people on this one particular method that we know works and to be able to have all of your staff within your school settings on the same page, it allows you to take more of a multidisciplinary approach and there's definite consistency going on within the team. It makes sure that every person involved with that child's treatment program, including the speech and language pathologist, the occupational therapist, the teachers, the aides, all of these individuals to be able to be trained so that they can all work together effectively with the child. Parents that are using CARD eLearning can use it either to train themselves and then after having done that they can implement uh, different techniques with their child in order to teach new skills. Um, but oftentimes parents might also be working either with an ABA provider, with a school, or they may have even hired their own therapist to deliver the intervention techniques. So CARD eLearning can be used um, either to collaborate with your school, it can also be used to train the therapists that are coming to the home of the parents, uh, or it can also be shared with the ABA provider so that that provider can find out about it and perhaps implement it within their organization and train their staff.
you can also do um, reporting for your organization. So you can actually look and find out which teachers are progressing, what their quiz scores are, and actually we can give you reports as well that will help you to compare the different teachers and their performances. Card e-learning is really, really simple to use. You can log on to this as long as you have a computer, that's all you need, and an internet connection. And you can work on it any time of the day, anywhere that you're at. When you log on, you realize that right away. First of all, um, on the top of the page, there's a navigational tutorial. It's a how to use this page button. Simply by watching that video, it'll all kind of unfold in front of you, and it becomes extremely self-explanatory. Um, Card eLearning has nine modules and you can basically go through those at your own pace. Um, you're going to be watching videos that are kind of like um, a storyboard with narration, but in addition to that there's many different video clips of therapists actually implementing the techniques that are being described within the storyboard that you can also watch. And then of course you're able to pause, you're able to type notes right directly underneath the video that you're watching. You can save your notes, you can review them, and um, between each module you do take a quiz and once you pass that quiz you can go on to the next module and then after you complete all of them you have a final exam and by completing the final exam and passing with a score of 85 percent or better you will be given a certificate of completion. Let me show you how easy it is to use Cardi Learning. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and I'm here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. So thrilling to have you here today. And you have this inspirational story that you want to share with us. Sure, sure. So yeah, I was reading the newspaper this morning and uh, this isn't related to autism directly, but sometimes I think it's good to sort of connect to the broader yeah, community of absolutely. folks with challenges. Um, so yeah, I read this in the newspaper this morning. Um, three climbers, uh, Craig DeMartino, Pete Davis, and Jerem Fry just completed the first all disabled ascent of El Capitan in Yosemite. This was yesterday, June 14th, 2012. Uh, this is uh, El Capitan is one of those sort of lifelong dream ascents that pretty much anyone who's a serious climber that's on their bucket list. That's uh -huh. something they want to tick off before they're dead. And um, these guys did it. Um, all three of them on this team um, have some kind of very significant um, physical disability. Uh -huh. All three of them are missing either uh, an entire or a partial limb. Um, it took them five days and four nights. They were actually sleeping in these things called porta ledges, which are basically like um, a cot that hangs from the wall. Um, five days and four nights to do the climb, which is actually pretty average, maybe a little bit slower than average, but actually not very, very bad. Um, the climb was almost 2,000 feet high, and so they're spending, you know, four days, five nights, uh, five, five days, four nights rather. Um, and it's just sort of inspirational um, that they were able to yeah. do this thing that, you know, if you or I, under the best possible circumstances, decided to spend the next year, 10 years training for this, we might not be able to do it. Wow. And these folks who, you know, uh, have these real significant challenges were able to achieve it. So it's just kind of... Uh, inspirational. Very inspirational. I think anytime somebody overcomes, it's. Uh, I think we can all celebrate in that. And as a parent, I, you know, my thing. I, I want to know where their moms are, right, what they're yeah. thinking. You know. Well, and you know, I was thinking it's it's kind of a good metaphor for um, for parents of, yeah. of kids on the spectrum. Is you know, is it's sort of like uh, well, one here. Let me just read a quote that yeah. uh, that one of these guys said. He said, "I never." Oh, right. So actually, let me give you a little more background. Okay. Uh, one of these guys um, had part of his right leg amputated after he had taken a hundred foot fall years ago. So they had to remove part of his leg wow. and his body was shattered, but he got back together, did his rehab and got back Came into back. doing what he loved. Another guy, one of the other guys lost his leg to cancer at a young age. Mm. And another guy was born uh, missing part of his arm. And so he only climbs with one arm. Wow. <laughs> Again, stuff that, you know, any, any really good climber wishes they could do at some point in their life. These guys are just doing. Wow. Here's a quote. I never really felt like my shattered body was a reason to stop doing what I love, he said. Everyone is disabled by their excuses for why they can't do something, and that grounds them from doing the, the really great things they could do. Mm -hmm. But when we're out there trying, great things get accomplished. Wow. Um, isn't that a good metaphor for oh, just day-to-day -day surviving and commitment, yeah. you know? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, because uh, it seems like that's, I mean, that's one thing I hear all the time from parents is just this overwhelming um, fear, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. um, and and at the end of the day, the only thing you really can do is get back in there, get back in yeah. the fight and do your best. Yeah, I, I had friends visiting the last two days and uh, the one friend was saying, you know, how did you make it through this journey? And I said, you know, honestly, 
what I saw in other parents was that they made a decision. Well, we're just going to do everything. That there isn't a win or a lose on this journey. We're just going to do everything that we can and fight every individual day to get as much gain as much ground as we can. There is no option of failure. There is no option of quitting. It's just that decision. And I said, you know, if I could do that with everything else in my life, <laughs> what could I accomplish? Yeah, really but true. there was no possibility of, okay, well, we've tried that enough. We're done. Uh, it was just, what are we going to accomplish today? Mm -hmm. And and I always like to think of the metaphor that somebody had shared with me, because I am not a mountain climber. I believe you do that. That I won't be doing that. <laughs> That's not even on the list at all. But the idea that when you go to climb a mountain and you stand at the base of the mountain and look up, it looks impossible. Yeah, and that's true. It really does. But that when you start to climb up, and for most of us, when we walk up a mountain, not <laughs> fixing anything and climbing up it, but when we walk up a mountain and you start to walk, and maybe it's not a direct route, but you start to walk, you no longer can see the top. You're just focusing on what's in front of you. That's right. And you find yourself making progress. That's right. And that's a great metaphor for any major challenge in life. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you know, when you go to, when you go to college, if you think, how am I going to get the next four years done? Forget yeah. it. You know, right. you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna fail the first day. Uh, it's all, it's always about just taking off a, a reasonable bite that you can chew on, and mm -hmm. and you know, doing a reasonable amount, doing one foot in front of the other, basically, yeah. one yeah. day at a time, as, as folks. Yeah. Say. Or as you like to say, how do you eat an elephant? One, one bite at a time. time. There yeah. we go. Exactly. Well, kudos to these people. Truly inspirational. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us, because. I, I, I love that. When we're out there trying, great things get accomplished. Yeah, it's pretty good, huh? It's and, you amazing. Know, it kind of reminds us of just a common sense ABA thing, which one of my favorite things that I've learned from ABA is you can worry about things all you want. You can think about it all you want. You can plan about it all you want. You can have any emotions that you want, good, bad, negative, positive, otherwise. But at the end of the day, what really matters is do the behavior. Yeah. Just get out there, do the behavior. You know, do That's the thing. Amazing. Identify the thing that matters to you, that you value, mm -hmm. that matters to you and your family, and just do it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you brought up. Uh, worrying in that sentence and that's sort of my next thing that I wanted to talk to you about we went to you were there I was there at the ABAI conference and there was so much happening there yeah. it was amazing really the amount of knowledge of yeah. thousands of presentations and you know you just wanted to I certainly wanted to divide into a thousand people and go and see all of them and felt like I'm missing so much uh, it was bigger than Disneyland in that respect mm -hmm. you know how you just think you know we, we have a, a, a goal we're gonna get this much done at Disneyland and you can never do it all but it was that on steroids and um, but one of the things that really that you know because then you come home and you think okay what did I learn and what was exciting after the fact and there was a lot of discussion I found and maybe it was just what my ear was attuned to about anxiety uh -huh. and there was one particular uh, presentation that I went to where four different people spoke about anxiety and what really I don't I you know I'm not a numbers person I'm not a statistics person but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 percent higher rate of children on the spectrum having anxiety issues, mm -hmm. whether it was a full-on anxiety disorder or just issues with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I, that was kind of stunning to me in one of those ways where I wasn't overly surprised by it, but it, it just kind of just made kind my... Of hit home. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and so it was one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, anxiety, sure. and I know a lot of people uh, want to medicate their kids, and we've mm -hmm. talked about this a little bit before, about what's the research say about medication and anxiety in kids right. with an autism spectrum diagnosis? Sure. Well, and, you know, for, for full disclosure, I should first say I'm um, anxiety not my area of expertise mm -hmm. necessarily, um, but from what I am aware of, um, there's very little research. Um, actually, unfortunately, there's not a lot of research on treating anxiety in children with ASDs, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. um, but there's very, very little research, maybe zero, um, supporting the use of medication mm -hmm. um, for children. Supporting. Not right. that there's none at all, but very little supporting it. Yeah. And so it's not to say it doesn't work. It's just to say there hasn't been very much research done mm -hmm. on it. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't work. I've, right. you know, I've, I've heard many clinical reports and talked to many colleagues who've mm -hmm. said it's made a huge difference. And many mm -hmm. parents, frankly, have mm -hmm. said uh, their, their child on the spectrum was suffering from anxiety and um, uh, some sort of SSRI or other medication was helpful. So it, it's entirely possible that it works. Uh, but you know, my job as a scientist here is to point out where there is and isn't research. And right. as far as I'm aware, there isn't a lot of research on that topic. Okay. Um, However, there isn't a lot of research on other forms of treatment for anxiety either, okay. so that's something to consider. Um, 
But what we do in applied behavior analysis is very frequently has beneficial effects on anxiety um, because a lot of what we do anyways and a lot of what's sort of common sense from an ABA perspective is actually what uh, would be recommended by research on anxiety treatment in other populations. Okay. Um, so for example, a major thing is exposure to, to feared stimuli mm -hmm. and feared situations. In ABA, what we do is gradually expose kids to stuff they don't want to do. Yeah. Right? Um, and whether it's new social situations, whether it's completing academic tasks, whether it's self-care tasks that involve scary stimuli, mm -hmm. you know, um, could even be sort of sensory things that the mm -hmm. kids are afraid of, maybe having sand on their hands at the beach, maybe it's, you know, soap on their hands when they're washing their hands. What we do anyways in ABA is gradual exposure to whatever the um, problematic situation is. T piling on tons of positive reinforcement, mm -hmm. teaching appropriate coping strategies and alternative behaviors, and then reinforcing the heck out of those behaviors. Yeah. So what you're doing is pairing positive reinforcement with a feared situation. Yeah. Um, and so what we do find is a lot of feared situations become neutral and sometimes even preferred after we do what we would kind of just normally do anyways in ABA. Yeah. As long as you're taking a real positive and gradual and you know positive reinforcement based approach, not just purely a drill sergeant, you know, right. force exposure. It's approach. not throwing them in the deep end of the pool yeah. and saying, get, you know, figure it out. Right. Uh, actually, one of our w words of the day, our jargon of the day earlier in the week was systematic desensitization. Oh, there you go. So, exactly. And we've been talking about that a little bit this week. And I had shared that my son, I didn't even realize it was having a problem with tiled floors. We were mm -hmm. getting tantrums oh, yeah. when he would transition onto a tile floor and I just I was going why is this happening and finally you know was he barefoot or with shoes no shoes huh. he just uh, didn't there, like the tile floor. yeah there was actually a grocery store that we would be in and we were the one part of the grocery store had a very slick shiny floor mm -hmm. and then we would there's a very rough transition onto some very tiled floor that's right by the dairy products and he would snake out every time we went to the dairy products hmm. and of course I was thinking it's the dairy products the dairy, yeah. and I was thinking <laughs> antecedents well we just went and looked at the octopus Maybe there's something, and he found the octopus really reinforcing. But why are we having the problem in the dairy products? And I couldn't figure it out, Jonathan. And and finally, we had the team come. They said, "Let's look at it." And of course, yeah. they walked in and saw what I, as a parent, didn't see—the floor changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's and then said, "Where else is he having this kind of reaction?" And I, I thought, "Oh, when we leave Disneyland." And I always thought it was just that there was so oh. much sensory going on in Disneyland. But when you get off the elevator and get to the parking structure, you have to walk down the tiled floor. Okay. And, really and he was a mess. He would really get completely disorganized and be a mess. And so they worked on him. It's, it's a non-issue now. A non-issue. So do they do gradual exposure oh, yeah. and positive reinforcement? And positive that, reinforcement. Yeah. We would go to the store and, and they would, you know, and it didn't take very long at all, but they went very slowly. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and I as a parent would never have realized you could have, for a year, I could have, I just would have gone on with the tantrums mm -hmm. in the store mm -hmm. and been scratching my head. Um, well, that's why our job is to be parents. It's not to treat our kids, you know. That's yes. why professionals exist. Yes, it's, it's hard exactly. enough to, to just do what we need to do on a daily basis with our kids, let alone treat yeah. them, you know. But I think it's hard sometimes as a parent you think, well, I should... I should be able to figure that out. I should be able to know, and we can't. That, that one's pretty esoteric. I have to say, like a lot of good ABA folks would not have made that observation. That really? Is, yeah, that's pretty. That's, oh, because they got it the first well, second, and they were like, "They're well, doing a good job. Yeah. They're trained observers." You know, <laughs> but that, that is fair. Well, and honestly, I had taken notes on it too, and said, "I've looked at it this way, and we've, and I had tried this and that and the other thing, and said, I." You know, come and look at it because I have no idea. Hmm. Um, but, you know, it got taken care of very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and it's always the thing that I say, this is why you have to call somebody mm -hmm. in. You mm -hmm. can't have expectations that you have eyes in the back of your head or that you'll see it from a 360 perspective. But um, but the systematic desensitization and, and dealing with it and reinforcing the behavior and going, it, mm -hmm. it works. I mean, Absolutely. I saw that work with my son, but you're saying, you know, it well, works. Well, it, it does because there's some basic um, behavioral learning principles that apply to all of us and everything that we do, whether we like it or not. So even mm -hmm. if we really wanted to continue, continually be afraid of something, mm -hmm. if someone exposed us to it really gradually and mm -hmm. really repeatedly and didn't allow us to escape it when we we're afraid, 
we would get used to it, yeah. like it or not. And yeah. that can actually work against you, too. If you get exposed to really great things too much, you can get used to those, too, yeah. and, and stop appreciating those things. Yeah. Um, it's just a fundamental way of how organisms adjust to their environment. Okay, really important. To, and, and I was saying to you during the break that one of the things I certainly, and I've talked about it before on the show, that in the middle of therapy and everything that we were going through, I started having anxiety issues. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, you know, that's a terrible thing and not to be talking about and of course, you know, a certain yeah. amount of shame that went with it but I got help for it and it you know I got to the point where I couldn't leave the house mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I was having anxiety at such a level and then when I started talking about it what parents overwhelmingly came back and said to me was that they also of course were having anxiety issues and then of course I thought oh okay so I'm not alone in this and they felt like they weren't alone in it but I got help too mm -hmm. and I actually mm -hmm. think that me you know being in a place where I said okay I need help with this and getting the help helped my son with anxiety. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so that I, my, and my hope is, and I always watch him. I see that he has different weird things. That he, uh, his new thing is that he tells everybody he's afraid of heights. Huh. And uh, and he is reacting as though he's afraid of heights. Let's take him rock climbing. <laughs> there you go. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. And I'm afraid of heights. And I keep saying, okay, did he just start saying this because he heard me say it? Um, but he is reacting as if he's afraid of heights. So that's going to be our new thing to take on. And All I don't know right. who's going to do that. It won't be me because... I am afraid, You're of, afraid of heights. <laughs> That's great. So uh, yeah, no, no rock climbing in my future. <laughs> um, but I do think it's important for us to acknowledge that everybody has some anxiety, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and and it's very. I'm not. Mm. I'm not sure exactly what the stats are for families of, of folks with autism, but I know that it's high, and it's higher than the than the average population. Of, of course, you're going to have anxiety. I mean, you get you know hit with this ton of bricks. If yeah. your child has this pervasive developmental disorder, and probably the person that diagnosed your child told you something horrible, like that you know you're going to have to be in an institution, or he's never going to learn to talk, or he's never going to have a job, or he's never going to be able to say I love you. Um, and so, of course, that's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. And, and how could that not produce anxiety, yeah. right, as a parent? Yeah. I mean, to me, that seems like actually a normal response to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That doesn't Absolutely. seem like an abnormal response. Absolutely. Um, but nevertheless, it can be very debilitating. And, and, yeah. and parents, um, unfortunately, don't somehow that those two pieces have not been connected. The, mm -hmm. the ABA autism piece and the anxiety for parents piece have not been connected. And, um, and they need to be. I mean, that should be a standard part of triaging care for the family unit yeah. is okay your kid's gonna get intensive ABA and you should be assessed for do you do you need some treatment for your anxiety too yeah, you know absolutely. or some kind of support at least absolutely and I you know Evelyn Gould's been coming in and talking to us about ACT mm -hmm. That's right. and that ACT isn't just for parents of children on the spectrum but you know that more and more people are looking at that as a way of helping parents to deal with the emotions and and the stress That's which right. often balloon the anxiety into a place where where it prevents you from being able to help your kid even. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm grateful that I was clear enough to say this is preventing me from being able to I could started out I couldn't drive and so I couldn't drive mm -hmm. to clinic but mm -hmm. my husband was there to drive me to clinic and but eventually I went this is not good right. uh, I have to be able to show up for my kid so I have to get help I know the other people who can't see that clearly and that's you know yeah. really frightening yeah it's fairly common when you're in the middle of something it's hard to see it you know yeah. I and mean, that's almost a defining feature of, of disorders usually is you can't really tell that you have it you know yeah. you can't really tell that you're suffering from those challenges so that's good that you're able to figure that out and yeah well I have a good husband <laughs> who also pointed out and said you're having a problem hey go deal with this <laughs> yeah no and he didn't say go deal with it he said we need to deal with this which Fantastic. was even better yeah, yeah. That's really good. I, I married a really great guy thank heaven I don't know how I got so lucky because uh, I sure don't deserve him but uh, I'll keep him anyway uh, we should take a break before we digress any further and we'll be back with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox stick with us When Maddie was diagnosed, I'll be honest, I was very ignorant on what autism was. I knew that autism was basically something that hit boys at the age of two to three and shut down. And sometimes you think of the typical Rain Man uh, movie. Um, and with Maddie, she was doing all the same signs and symptoms of a, of a typical child with autism spectrum disorder. Stand up. didn't even acknowledge us coming into the room. Um, she had 
barely any eye contact. Um, she didn't interact with her sisters. She didn't really do anything. She just basically lined up her toys and that was about it. We have a team of seven volunteers, or, or eight now, eight volunteers, including my husband and I, and I'm the team leader, and so I do all the curriculum and get everything ready each week. Jana was downstairs until 11 o'clock at night working on curriculum, going through two different textbooks. And then we, as a group, meet on Monday nights, and we would go through what the curriculum was from Jana, and a lot of times we would go, well, how exactly do you do that? How do you sit her at the table and, and do this trial base? Well, what skills has done for us, it's, it's taken that away from Jana trying to figure out the curriculum for one. She can go down, or on our, even our laptop, and she can sit down and through all these questions, it comes up with the different programs. At least for me, it was a relief off my shoulders. I was worried that I might be missing something. Um, missing a curriculum that maybe she needs to know where the skills they have every every possible thing your child needs to know from zero to seven they have a program for that what noise is this yeah. every program that we did with her I knew it was specific for what she needed to learn because before skills it was a lot of okay, well, is that really age appropriate for a two-year-old? You know, because it's not generalized. It's anywhere from zero to seven. This is what your child needs to know in most, in most manuals you'll find. Um, but for this, okay, yep, yeah, she should be learning this. And no, she's not four yet. She doesn't need to know that yet. We are so fortunate that Jana was able to attend a conference put on by CARD that opened the door for skills and that um, there's no looking back for us. We started using the program in November. It seemed like by January something just clicked and she has completely kind of came out of her fog that she was in for quite a while. I have never read a documented case on any child that has not benefited anything from applied behavior analysis. And uh, now with this new skills and being, you know, like the E version of ABA, I can't imagine it doing anything harmful to their child. It, it's nothing but exponential growth for us. To see her now, it, is, it just blows us away. I mean, we call her our little miracle child because um, in seven months' time, she has just blossomed into this normal, functioning child. And suddenly, we joke about it all the time, like suddenly we have twins. If you're even thinking about doing it, do it. Because the absolute worst thing you can do is do nothing at all. And even if you use this program and it's just a single mom or a single dad working in the evenings with their child, this program is gonna benefit them. It's, it's gonna show you where they are, it's gonna show you where they need to go, and it's gonna show you what skills and how to get there. It is an online book on how to help recover your child. Welcome back to Autism Live. Our special guest right now is Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. And you guys have a, a, an event coming up that That's we correct. should talk about with the Autism Research Group. Tell mm -hmm. us what you're going to be doing. So we are putting on a, a free conference for parents in the Korean American community uh, for families affected by autism. Mm -hmm. um, at Autism Research Group, one of our major um, features or parts of our mission is dissemination of uh, scientific information on what works. Mm -hmm. And so basically Basically, it's our mission to get out there and tell families about what works and what doesn't and just give them uh, research-based information so that they can use that as tools to get their families the help that they need. Okay. Um, and so there's a major problem right now um, in a lot of different uh, subpopulations within the U.S. and that is a lot of folks, even if they do have access to um, uh, ABA treatment and even if they have access to funding for ABA treatment, they simply don't even know about it. Right. And so there's a huge amount of folks out there who could actually be getting top quality treatment for their children and they simply don't even know that it exists or they don't know that they have a right to it. Right. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to put on this conference. It's um, June 23rd. Okay. 
so a week after this Saturday, uh, and it's at the Gl Glory Church of Jesus Christ, which is a mm -hmm. Korean church in Koreatown in mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles. Okay. Um, and basically, it's a three-hour conference uh, for families. Uh, we're going to talk about research. We're going to talk about funding for uh, treatment. We're going to talk about um, teaching daily living skills, things like toileting, dressing, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and we're going to talk about managing challenging behavior. So basically, just try to give useful information to right. parents. All free. All free. Yep. Uh, we're even providing child care for free. Wow, that's amazing, <laughs> really. Yeah, I'm basically making all of my folks come in on a Saturday and help out and, and do babysitting. <laughs> Can I tell you, though, that actually, and I, I, and I always tell people to have like a local support group and a, a larger support group. And in my local support group the other day, uh, there was a call for, I didn't realize that it was for the, this exact thing, a call for anybody who has teenagers to help the people that you have that are going to be doing. Fantastic. It was in my local support that is fantastic so, because I I reached out to multiple different support groups yes. saying hey if anyone can lend us a hand it wouldn't yes. hurt if yeah if they have teenagers who want to help volunteer babysitting and whatever. it was very clear they won't be in charge right. but that they can be support staff for right. helping at this event and now you're also going to be translating that's correct all of the presentations are going to be oral PowerPoint presentations mm -hmm. all of the PowerPoint slides have all of the information in English and Korean side by side so that's pretty amazing it's yeah it's a lot of work to put this together, actually. I'm but, sure. Uh, but we want to make it, uh, we want that information to be accessible to right. folks for whom English is not their first language and maybe right. aren't fluent. Um, they're here, they're in the United States, they have equal right to access to treatment for their yeah. children, so they, they need this information as well. That's incredible. And so if people want more information about it, they can go to the ARG site, right? AutismResearchGroup.org. Okay. AutismResearchGroup.org. And they'll see that it's uh, it's right there and mm -hmm. they can click There's on it. There's a flyer posted on that. They okay. should go, scroll down to the bottom of the page. There's mm -hmm. an events calendar and they can click on June 23rd um, and that'll open up the flyer for the conference. Okay. And the flyer is in both Korean and English. Okay. And and so is this something that you're going to be doing more of? Like, do you have a plan to do more of uh, different groups like that? We do, yeah. We have our, a general sort of outreach program of um, getting information out there to um, underserved populations. Mm -hmm. uh, so another majorly underserved population is folks uh, for whom um, Spanish is their first I was language. I going to say. You yeah. know, we're right here in the valley, San Fernando Valley. There's probably a million people, Spanish-speaking families here, yeah. um, not, not a lot of folks receiving treatment. Yeah. Um, and again, it's a major issue of inequity. I feel like it's yes. really a social injustice. So it really is. We want to help at least raise awareness. Yeah. I, you know, I remember in the early days with all the hoops that I was jumping through to get the services because I had access to services and funding, which I had not known. Right. I mean, you know, Absolutely. Uh, who would know that? Who but somebody know? told me. And, I, and then I had hoops to jump through to make that work. And I kept thinking, man, you know, I have a master's degree and I have a command of the English mm -hmm. language and I'm struggling and with this. And it's still challenging, yeah. What must this be like for somebody who does not speak a lick of English? That's exactly Exactly right. And you know, frankly, um, even families who English is their first language but are socioeconomically disadvantaged, yeah. that's a major issue as well. Yeah. I don't know if you saw these data from the um, uh, California Department of Developmental Services. They published data showing um, how much money was spent yeah. on autism services for yeah. families. And if you compare um, the amount of money spent per child in the South Central Los Angeles area to the amount of money spent per child in Orange County area, yeah. and these are state taxes, these are right. not county taxes. Taxes, right. state taxes, so it should be. It equal, should have been equal right? and even, yeah. It's literally 10 times more in yeah. Orange County than in South Central LA. And again, uh, probably a lot of that has to do with lack of awareness, lack yeah. of resources. A lot of these folks probably don't even have internet necessarily. Yeah. They don't uh, have access to the same information and they don't realize that they have uh, a voice, you know, yeah. and that they have a, a right to access these treatments. Yeah, I, it was disgusting. And I think a lot of people who looked at it, I certainly as a parent was looking at it and, and looking at where I live and how much was being spent That's on right. average per child and seeing and, and knowing that my child wasn't any more deserving of those services right. than other areas and just thinking, okay, but there's definitely a lack of advocacy Absolutely. that parents having the information and knowing that they could ask for something. That's right. But we see this all the time in the support group that parents will come on and say, hey, you know, I need to go in front of this group of people and ask for this much funding. What is everybody else 
asked for and gotten. Mm -hmm. And you, I will look at that and go, oh, I didn't even know we could ask for that. Right. In the area of respite, mm -hmm. I had no idea I was entitled to respite or how much. Right. Even Just said to my provider and said, you know, oh, can, I can have respite. And they said, yes, how much did you want? And I said, well, I, how much can I have? And they're like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. You tell us how much you need <laughs> and you give proof for it. But I went to that local support group and said, what am, you guys, what am I supposed to ask for? And this whole conversation, very, but if you don't know, you don't know. Right, yeah, if you don't know. Um, yeah. So right now for those Korean families, mm -hmm. this is a wonderful event. What day is it again? It's, it's the June 23rd okay. from 1 to 4 p.m. Okay. in uh, Koreatown. Okay, free. Free. Um, coffee free and care. snacks will be provided for free. Free child care. Snackage. Um, That's yeah. always a good thing, <laughs> <always> right? Good. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe something you'll tell us uh, in the future for Spanish-speaking families. That's right. Our goal so, is to reach out to Spanish-speaking families, to reach out to socioeconomically disadvantaged families, um, and to just get out there in, in general. Okay, great. And then you also have a survey on the site if people are going there to see about the, Kore right. the Korean event. Um, um, you have a survey that parents can be taking while they're there. Tell That's us right. a little bit about that. So we're still in the process of writing up a grant application that will um, fund research on parent training and basically parent support services. Mm -hmm. And so we have some ideas that we think are great ideas about what parents would like support on. Mm -hmm. um, but instead of just going with our great ideas, we thought, why not actually ask the people who will be receiving the services, right? right? To actually ask families, what do you need help with? What right. do you value the most in terms of uh, support and training services for your family? Um, so we have a survey online. Uh, we'd like folks to check out. Um, if you have a, an individual with uh, autism in your family, please go take the survey. Yeah. It's real quick, maybe five minutes at the most. And basically all it's doing is saying, what matters to you? What right. kind of training would you like to receive? And let me point out, this is not a replacement for ABA therapy. Right. This is in addition to ABA therapy. Right. Um, some folks are getting nervous about um, some funding providers trying to push them towards parent training only right. rather than professionally delivered therapy. Right. And that's, there's no research to support that model. Right. And that's not what we're talking about. We're right. talking about additional parent training services on top of right. a top quality ABA program. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So they can go to that website again that we just were showing. Spend take the survey. It's free. It's, uh, it's absolutely free. You're not going right. to get a bunch of spam that comes with it at all. No, absolutely not. In fact, you don't identify yourself. You don't put okay. in your email address. There's no way. We're not right. getting anything from you. We're not selling anything. Right. Um, and when we uh, apply for this grant, it will be for someone else to pay for these services. So again, right. we're not trying to sell anything. We're literally right. asking what kind of services would you like for right. free. Literally asking how can they better serve you. Right. So you might might as well might take as well advantage take of that. Take the survey. Right. <laughs> uh, and you guys are very. I love. You know, that's all part of your mission that you're looking to serve us, that you, you're wanting to know what kinds of research we want. I, you know, I want to ask the question, why? Because nobody else is doing that. So there must be a reason why people don't. So why are you wanting to do that? Um, well, I guess for me, it really came from my origins in mm -hmm. ABA and how I got into this field. And that was working in the living room of a mom of a kid with autism, you know, and there were no professionals, there were no services. Um, I think I've told this story on your show before. This this poor kid, he was an eight-year-old kid, uh, the school district had no idea how to deal with him. They were literally putting him in a coat closet and he was mm -hmm. urinating on himself. And yeah. that was education, right? And so, so mom said, forget it, I'm taking him out of school and I'm gonna figure out how to do it myself. And mm -hmm. so she hired consultants to come in and train us. And all the therapists working with her kid were a bunch of college kids, that's what yeah. I was. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. Um, but you know, the mom was just so dedicated and um, she just did whatever it took. And yeah. I don't know, it was just that level of dedication, that level of passion and commitment um, that to me, that's what this is all about. I mean, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have gotten into this field. That's mm -hmm. what this field is about. Um, so it's, I mean, it's great to help the kid individually. Of course, that's right. what the treatment's for. It's for the kid, but it's much more than that. It's about the family unit. It's mm -hmm. about the whole system. Um, and I don't know, that's just, where else should research come from? Like, what, what, well, I agree right? with you. It makes total sense, but you're the only ones doing that, asking us. Well, we're trying. And and frankly, I wasn't trained to do that. No, scientists are not trained to do that. They're not okay. trained to say, hey, go ask, go ask the patient what, what kind of research <laughs> they want. That's not a normal part of training as a research scientist. Right. I'm sure there's exceptions to that. Right. Um, but generally speaking, we're trained to follow what we believe is intellectually and scholarly uh, 
uh, imp imp important, uh, yeah. of scholarly importance. And that matters too, obviously, right? right? Um, but um, yeah, it seems like taking into account what families actually need and value is a great place to start. I think it's wonderful and I applaud you and I think it's fabulous and I hope that if you're listening to this you will visit the their site, um, take the survey, uh, input your information about what kinds of things you, there it is on the screen for you, about what kinds of things you want research done on. Uh, we were talking about voting the other day and you know there are people who don't register and they don't vote and that's fine but you just don't get to complain when you don't right. <laughs> you lose the ability to complain. That's right. If you have the option to participate that's and you take advantage of it then you get to complain and hopefully make things better but if you don't want to participate then how is anybody ever going to know what you want. So we have this wonderful opportunity at no cost to us to be able to be heard and hopefully have some research monies be spent on the things that we prize. That's a wonderful gift that you've given Thank us. You. So that's a fabulous thing. So take advantage of it. Uh, we're, we're at the end of our time. It always goes so quickly. I so enjoy talking to you and thank you so much. You're such an inspiration to all of us. Well, thank really you. I appreciate, appreciate it. I appreciate and uh, I'm anxious to hear how it goes with the Korean families and yeah, what you really come back. Forward to it. Uh, that sounds really exciting. Yeah. And, and I hope you'll come back and tell us when it's time for the Spanish speaking families. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to take a break and we'll be back in just a minute. That's bad. Hi, we're here today with Cecilia Knight, who is the Director of Training for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And today I'm thrilled to have her here because we're going to talk about manding. What is manding? A request um, that you would make of another person. Why is manding one of the first things that seems to come up in most programs? Okay. Um, well, a baby um, requests for his mother's attention by crying or by reaching. And so it's one of the first ways that you let another person know what you need. Mm -hmm. And then that other person reinforces you by either picking you up or giving you something to drink or something to eat. And so many of our clients um, aren't really good at that once we start a program with them. And unfortunately, uh, many of them engage in inappropriate manding. Um, screaming, kicking, biting. And so what we're trying to do early on is no longer reinforce the inappropriate ways of asking and rather reinforce the appropriate ways of asking. And as we teach them an appropriate way to ask for, um, mom, play with me, um, can I have juice, or you know, even more simply, help, um, then we see those inappropriate mans decreasing and the appropriate mans increasing because um, the child's wants and their desires um, aren't really changing, but we're teaching them the right way to get their needs met. So manding doesn't have to actually be spoken. It can be nonverbal as right. well. And um, that's exactly right. They could exchange an icon. And if I bring you an icon with a cup on it and hand it to you, and you bring me um, a juice cup, then we've made an exchange. And so there is what Skinner would call verbal behavior. You have reinforced um, my request for a cup or for juice. So when we say verbal behavior, we're not talking about vocal behavior necessarily. That's right. It's just that it's a conversation of some sort. What is reinforcing to the child? The man is evoked by the child's desire or um, their need for something. So early on, we may arrange the situation where I know that they're interested in the juice and they're reaching for it. I may um, hold it back um, to just say, say juice or ja or whatever is appropriate for that child. And then as soon as they emit any sort of response, give a high level of praise and then immediately give them the juice. So what controls the man is that specific reinforcer. So of course, if the child asks for a juice cup and you bring something else, then they're not being reinforced with what they asked um, to have. Okay. What do you want? Wait. Wait for Good job. Wait. You say wait nice for please. Wait for please. Good talking. Thank you, Dad. 
Thank you, Daddy. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We just uh, finished a segment with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, who is the head of research and development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I don't know about you, but I just love when we get an opportunity to talk to him because it all starts to make sense. In the world as a parent, you know, you're hearing all these different things. And I remember when Jem was diagnosed and I, I, I felt like I lived on the computer. I was doing so much research, but being able to put it through some sort of a filter to have it make sense. And one of the things I did arrive at was saying, well, I, I have limited amount of time to spend on this. I've got this window. I got to get this child, this early intervention that everybody says, but what, how am I going to do this and what am I going to do? And very quickly, it started to make the most sense to look at, instead of reinventing a wheel, looking at what had worked before and many times before. And so I started to look at what actually had had research done on it and showed it showed in the research to be effective and not just with one group of kids but across a variety of different kids because as we've talked about today our kids are different they just are and what I quickly found what and I was saying this earlier that ABA 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 uh, showed that it was what scientifically was proven now that was a huge piece of it but the other part of it was that I ran into a parent and I got to see their child firsthand and hear from that parent this is what we did and this is what worked and this is what you need um, and because that parent and I saw that firsthand and saw that story and said okay this is what I want for my child and I can want that and put my eggs into this basket because I know that scientifically it's been proven to be effective those two things together is what motivated my husband and I through all the difficulties that we had in getting those services and figuring out how we were going to make our lives work while we did this intervention. So I I love it when Jonathan uh, Tarbox comes in here, Dr. Tarbox, and reminds us about the research and what's important, because I do think that's an important component that we need to look at at a regular basis and remind ourselves that this works, we know it works, and it doesn't just work for one child, it works for all of our children. Yes, outcomes are always going to be different because our kids are different. Our circumstances are different. The amount of therapy that they get is different, um, although we want want to be in the window there between 25 and 40 hours a week. It's a lot. I guarantee you, though, it's worth it. It is so worth it. And making your mind up and saying, okay, this is something that we need to be in a process for, like the mountain climbers, and saying, we're, you know, today we're watching our feet. We're watching the signs along the way. We know where we're going. We know we're going to the top of the mountain. We don't know when we're going to get there but we're focusing on what needs to be done today. There is no uh, no element of failure, right? There's no possibility of that. It shouldn't even be on our radar. We're going to get where we're going to get, and we're going to keep on keeping on until we get there. Uh, and what a wonderful thing for us to leave the week from, right? We're just going to keep on keeping on. Uh, we know this is what's effective, so this is, this is where we're going to spend our time and our energy. Uh, and that's a positive thing. All right, as this show ends the conversation continues you guys there are so many ways to get in touch with us and you can be speaking to dr jonathan tarbox he's with us every friday at 11 o'clock but you don't have to wait for next week to ask a question you can email us uh, you can phone us you can skype if you want to uh, to get a hold of us we uh, are we monitor facebook you can be on facebook and and talk to us in that way and ask your questions and we can ferry it to dr jonathan tarbox or anybody else, you can tweet your questions to us. By the way, it doesn't have to be a question. It can be a comment. Uh, we're people just like anybody else, and we like to be reinforced if you want to say, I loved this comment. This helped me today. That helps us. It really does, because then we go, all right, well, you know, then we'll keep on in this direction. Uh, if you want to say, you know, this comment didn't help us, then we know, okay, well, that's not where we're going to go anymore. Um, but give us your comments 
comments. Give us your suggestions of things that you'd like to hear more about. We're cycling through some of the different ways that you can be watching us over the weekend. You can be watching us on Blip TV. You can be watching us on YouTube. You can be watching us on iTunes. You can be watching us on Ustream. And of course, always, you can be watching us here on autism-live.com. This show is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and of course, all those different ways of getting a hold of us are also available too. We we know that there is information that can be of use to you. We're just figuring out the ways to get it to you so that it's really consumable for you. We want for it to make sense to you in your life with all the things that you've got going on. If we're not getting that done, would you please tell us that we're not getting that done and let us know how it's not working for you so we can address that. But And if there is a way that it's working for you, let us know that too and say, you know, loving it on Blip TV. It's happening for us on Blip TV because uh, that's what we're here for is you. We know that this is a, a major undertaking. This child that you've got in your life that you want to do right by um, and we want to help you to do that so tell us how we can help you to do that tell us what's in your way to get ABA therapy and we can help you to do that all right we're going to be back on Monday at nine o'clock Pacific time live again in the studio and we have some really exciting guests coming up next week in fact Sienna Greener Wooten is going to be with us on Tuesday talking uh, about how we get started in ABA and expectations until Monday though please give your kiddos a hug from me. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye.